Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is story about what if Naruto reborn in Konoha and remember everything about his past life part 1 before I start, please do support for more amazing content and comments for part 2, do consider to subscribe my channel and share my video to your friends, and check out the description as well, let's start the video, I, I was being squeezed. Squeezed and pushed. The pressure on me growing to insurmountable levels. Everywhere. That's all I could feel. The pressure. That painful pressure that squeezed and constricted tightly around me, moving me forward. Pressure on my head, pressure on my chest, pressure on my throat, my throat. I couldn't breathe. The memory of large hands on my throat made me want to scream in terror. Large hands wrapping around my throat in this infernal darkness, seeing my struggling face reflected in two round mirrors of darkness. I wanted to scream, to cry out, to reach up and pull the hands away, but I could not. My throat had already closed over, and my limbs felt like they were made out of lead. But then the pressure was no more, and I released a choked cry from terror as my environment suddenly changed. From comfortable solitary darkness to a world filled with swirling lights that hurt my eyes. I had been born. Only this time I remembered being squeezed from a woman's uterus and emerging covered in a stranger's body fluids after a 38-hour labor. 38 hours. As labors went, it was definitely possible to have worse, but 38 hours was still a long time to be squeezed from a uterus, no matter what anybody says. Especially when you're conscious. Needless to say, with all the pushing and prodding and pressure, by the time I was born I was more than a little sleep deprived. I woke up blind. Snuggled between two warm bodies, it was then that I had my first real opportunity to understand what was happening to me. I was alive. Again. Not only that, but I was actually thinking. Thinking like an adult. Not like the newborn baby that I was. This wasn't normal. Obviously something had gone wrong. By all means I shouldn't be self-aware at this young an age. Would this mean that I would never experience infantile amnesia? Was that a good or a bad thing? Time passed as days turned into weeks that quickly culminated into months, and I slowly came to terms that I had to be spoon-fed and have my body cleaned for me, as though I were an invalid. Which I suppose I was. But it was still embarrassing and I hated it. But it's not like I had much of a say on the matter. My parents my new parents seemed intent on ingratiating themselves onto me, and I soon realized that with my growing affection towards them, my memories of my old parent were growing dimmer and more vague. I didn't want to forget them, but I was. Their voices were the first to go, followed by much later their faces until all I could recall of them were warped caricatures of their personalities and general traits that I retained only through a memory of a memory. It was rather distressing, so I tried to stop thinking about them. And slowly, over some time, I began to forget about the details of my previous life altogether. More time passed and mama was teaching me how to read by the time I was three years old. I was always hungry for knowledge, excited at the prospect of being able to read on my own. It took a while to learn to read the language that they spoke, but mama and papa seemed quite impressed with my progress. My sister would often help me with memorizing and drawing my characters after she came home from the academy where she was training to be a kanoichi. Father was a shinobi too, as was his father and his father before him my great-grandfather who was one of the first civilian-born shinobi in the country to attain the rank of jinin. It made me proud of my heritage. It was only fitting that I'd be trained as a kanoichi and carry on my family's pride so we could become a shinobi family. Shinobi, there was something so familiar about that word, something that was on the proverbial tip of my tongue, a feeling of vague familiarity with that single word. It was the same feeling I have when I see the symbol etched into father's hit I ate, an odd swirly symbol that was the sign of the shinobi of my village. I wanted to wear that symbol on my own hit I ate one day. Father began my own proper training when I was a little over four years old. Previously he had had mama work me through basic chakra control exercises, as well as making me memorize and learn every kanji they thought appropriate for me to learn at my age, and then some. I practically bounced with anticipation and excitement as father led me into our backyard to begin training. Finally, finally. I was actually going to start learning the good stuff, learning how to defend myself as well as my loved ones. However, father led me to the seat situated in front of the small cherry blossom tree that was still in bloom, although it was autumn and the weather was beginning to cool. Ayaka-chan. Hi. Ayaka-chan, I want to know what you want to be when you grow up. Father asked me, leaning in close to me. Know that I will not judge you. You can follow any path you wish with my blessing. I frowned, I had definitely not been expecting this. Of course he had to know what I wanted to be, I hadn't been practicing chakra control over the last 12 months to just turn around and say that I wanted to be a what? A waitress or a laundry maid instead. The A? O2 sent I I want to be a kanoichi. You know that. You do know that being a shinobi is very dangerous life-threatening, in fact. You're going to have to live a life by the rules and often put the sake and wants of others above your own needs. Was he trying to dissuade me from becoming a kanoichi? Surely not. 
I was the brightest in my preschool, and I had no doubts about it. At four years old I had above average chakra control even among the children of shinobi clans, an extremely large vocabulary, and perhaps most importantly I was motivated. I knew where I wanted to go, what career path I wanted to follow, and I knew that I would be able to do a great many things by following the road I was currently on. No one is going to stop me. The vehemence in that one sentence alone was both perplexing and helped soothe any doubts father might have implanted in me. It was just puzzling from where this integral admission had come from. Certainly not from me. I know, Papa. I know. I said, hoping he wouldn't question me further. Of course, he did. Then why? You can live a nice safe life, Ayaka. Away from danger. You can marry whomever you like as if and live a long life. You won't have to see people die. I won't have to see you die. You are my Aya, people die, Papa. People die all the time. People die because they're too weak. Pee people also die because they're too strong. People die from sickness, and pee people die in wars. I stuttered out, trying to construe my feelings. I I don't want to die from being weak. I don't want to die at all. But, uh, if I had the choice I would prefer dying for being strong dying for defending my village and family. Appa nodded, a small smile forming on his angular face, providing some warmth to his red eyes, and I let out a silent sigh of relief. He looked away from me, over my shoulder. I turned. Mama stood behind me, her beautiful face blank and unreadable. Obviously this had been her idea. I felt like I had passed a test, but of a nature that I was unable to determine. Very well, Mama said, giving me a small smile. I had every notion that she was trying to make me at ease, but I could still sense her uneasiness of sending another child out into the world to become a soldier. But this was my choice not hers. Appa nodded at Mama before she retreated back inside our home before turning to me. Today we'll just be doing some chakra control exercises, but from after today your mother will be teaching you chakra control. Why? Mama has already been teaching me chakra control, I interrupted. Appa gave me a stern look. Do not interrupt me, Ayaka. H. Hi. G. Gomenotu san, I acquiesced, ducking my head. What you've learned so far is only the basics of the basics, your mother will be teaching you how to apply chakra in real life scenarios, like to enhance your speed and strength. She will be extraordinarily good at developing your control due to her proficiency in Jinjutsu. Don't look at me like that Ayaka, your mother may not look like it at the moment, but she was a rather exceptional Jinjutsu user before she left duty when Kurunai was born. He explained with a distant look in his eyes before snapping back to the present. Meanwhile, I get to teach you all the practical and fun things, like Tajutsu and shuriken throwing. And then perhaps some jutsu when you're older. I squealed and clapped my hands in excitement. I'm sure that my eyes were sparkling. Can we work on them now? Right now? Papa smiled but shook his head slowly. No, for today we'll only be working on chakra control. To begin, we spent the rest of the afternoon sitting there, with father first coaching me through breathing exercises before showing me the basics to chakra control. I was only able to make it swish around in my torso and was unable to concentrate any chakra into any of my limbs, much to my chagrin. But you couldn't exactly be an expert on chakra control in the span of just a few hours. And by the end of the afternoon I was surprised to find that I was not only starving, but also so tired I could barely stand on my own. You've done really well today, Ayaka-chan, father said, helping me to my feet before giving up and pulling me up into his arms, carrying me towards our house. Your chakra reserves are steadily increasing, which is always a good sign. I perked up a little at the praise. But you've still to manage applying chakra to help aid your muscles before I let you touch anything like ninjutsu or jinjutsu. I wilted a little. Ayaka-chan. A voice called from our lounge room as father carried me in through the sliding door before placing me down on the mat-covered floor and retreating to his bedroom for some rest. He had a mission coming up in a few days, after all. Where are you, Ayaka-chan? Nisan. I called back, hurrying to the lounge room. I'm coming. I'm coming. Her and I greeted me with a hug in the doorway to the lounge room, and I squeezed her back hard. I saw you practicing with Otu-san, she noted, smiling at me kindly. My sister didn't have a bad bone in her body, and I adored that about her just as she seemingly adored me. I admit, she spoiled me a lot, sneaking me her slice of cake whenever mother went into a baking frenzy and smuggling me up onto the roof on some nights and showing me the unfamiliar constellations. I know. I'm going to start training, and father says that if I do well in his tajutsu lessons, I might be starting at the academy by the beginning of next year. I grinned. Her and I grinned back. Just make sure that you concentrate on your lessons. Tajutsu is going to be very important in defending yourself, especially if you're learning the family skillset. I frowned. Family skillset. What's that? Her and I's laugh tinkled like a bell, and she rubbed me on the head. Jinjutsu, of course. Both mama and father's families are learned in the illusory techniques of jinjutsu, so they have to make sure that they can protect themselves from physical attack. 
She seemed to be expecting an answer from me, perhaps whether or not I was keen to learn ninjutsu like our ancestors or move on to something a bit more mainstream. Perhaps ninjutsu. But as Kur and I stood there waiting for my answer a detail I had long since forgotten resurfaced in my memory about ninjutsu. That ninjutsu was the art of illusions and as such were incorporeal and difficult to use to your advantage in battle. It was practically unheard of to be able to physically harm someone through the use of ninjutsu only. But it was good at fooling and turning the battle in your favor, given that the enemy was unable to break the jinjutsu, of course. Her and I somehow seemed to understand my reverie and gave me a quick squeeze of a hug before wishing me goodnight and making her way to bed. Obviously I still had a lot of things to think about in becoming a shinobi for the village. And not just the question of if I was going to learn jinjutsu too. I didn't want to admit not even really to myself, but Papa's talk of certain death for a shinobi life had scared me, and I knew that I would end up spending most of the night awake and trying to weigh up the pros and cons of being a shinobi versus being a citizen. Sighing, I found Mama and Papa and bade them both goodnight before going up to bed myself. Starting at the academy was scary. I'd spent the whole night awake and practically bouncing off of my bedroom walls. Would I be good enough? Was I up to standard? Kur and I had told me that there was nothing to worry about that the civilian-born kids usually start with zero prior training. It was unfathomable especially after having experienced the training that my father had put me through. Though I suppose that it accounted for why there was a lack of civilian-born shinobi in the ranks. They would be hard-pressed to catch up to children who had been hardened and trained from the moment that they could walk. I started at the academy on a warm, sunny day. Papa had managed to push back taking his gen and team on their D-rank mission until that afternoon so that he and my mother could walk me in on my first day. I was so nervous of making a good first impression that I slipped my hand out of my mother's as we arrived on academy grounds. It was a large red building with a character for fire on a sign above the building. It was familiar to me, I had been here before with my mother when we had to go pick up Kurinai before she began insisting that she could make her own way home. Mother had been down about it for a while, Kurinai had come off as a little brusque, but I managed to keep her hands full and mind elsewhere by nagging her into more chakra exercises. With mama's help, I found that I was able to apply my chakra into techniques mostly just focusing chakra in my limbs to help strengthen them, but she also secretly taught me a jinjutsu. It was a small jinjutsu, one that had been taught to beginners of jinjutsu in her family for generations. It didn't do very much, merely causing the air to appear to ripple as if it were a hot day and thus was useless in a fight, but mother was ecstatic when I was able to seemingly master it on the first try. Although, she told me not to mention it to papa he wasn't a fan of his in-laws, apparently or perhaps they weren't fans of him. Either way, we Kurinai and I had no contact with our maternal side of the family. Mother snatched up my hand again, laughing when I tried to tug it away again. Eventually I just let her have my hand. There were plenty of parents there for the academy's orientation day. There were older students too, most performing small jutsus and such to impress the large amount of civilian families that were planning on sending their child into the academy to become a shinobi. It stunned me how they didn't seem to comprehend that all those backflips and low-level fire-style ninjutsus were to be used so that they could be used to fight to kill other people. It seemed wrong. The tools used in the act of taking another's life shouldn't be used as though they were simple acrobatics and magical tricks they were a means to an end, fair and simple. A means to a very violent end. Looking up at Papa, I saw him viewing the ogling crowd with slight disdain before he ushered us both into the building. The atmosphere was a little more relaxed within the academy's main building, and I recognized several clan symbols emblazoned on the garments of parents and children alike. The Iki family was not considered a clan, so we didn't have a clan symbol, although my father had often spoken of what it would look like if we ever did become a clan. He was particularly torn between an emblem depicting either a sakura blossom tree or the red evening sky. He held a fondness for both. Her and I was named after the latter, after all. Her and I had once whispered to me that mother was originally from a shinobi clan, though she didn't know which one and mama had refused to talk about it when I'd approached her on the subject. The academy was a tidy place, but it was in no way clean. Gouges and scratches and scuff marks were rampant on the floor, as well as some of the walls, and dirt had been tracked everywhere. However, I suppose it was to be expected when you handed excitable children sharp knives and told them that they were going to become ninja. My gaze was drawn upwards. At least it is tidy, I thought. There is nothing to trip. How on earth did scuff marks get on the ceiling? Father and mother didn't waste any time standing in the doorway and made a beeline for old acquaintances whose children were to be my classmates. Most of them were clan-born, but there were also a few civilian-born shinobi that Papa respected whose children would be starting with me at the academy. I wasn't sure how to act around either of them. I would give a half-hearted wave, a strained smile and subtly tug on Papa's pant leg to take us elsewhere. I wish the Kur and I were here, instead she was out on a training exercise at one of the training grounds with her class. 
It would have been nice to have her here. Gray San. A voice called from somewhere behind us. Gray. We turned. A man around Papa's age with long white gray hair tied into a simple ponytail stepped out from behind a teary civilian family and made his way towards us. I glanced up at Papa, he was grinning at the man widely. I stepped behind his legs so that I was out of sight. Tsukumo, father greeted, and they clasped hands like old friends. Perhaps they were old friends, seeing as Papa had greeted him without honorific. Though I certainly had no real clue, Papa made every effort to leave missions and his work out of his personal life. Though the name Sakumo did ring a bell, perhaps my father had mentioned him at some stage. Ah, Kagura-san. You look as lovely as ever. Mother had the decency to blush. It's good to see you again, sakumo kun Mama stated with genuine warmness. You should come join us for dinner sometime. It feels like we haven't seen each other since Mother trailed off, her smile fading, and she bites her lip, as if she said something that she shouldn't have. But whether she has or hasn't is apparently irrelevant as Sakumo keeps his friendly smile, and genuinely, I'd very much like that. Could I bring my son as well? I'd like him to meet his mother's best friend. Mother's eyes glistened and she looked like she was about to cry, which was odd. I'd never seen a grown-up cry before. The prospect unnerved me. Of course, Mama said softly. He is welcome anytime. Sakumo nodded before he turned back to my father. What brings you here, my friend? Sakumo asked. Yep, they were friends all right. My youngest starts her first day today, Papa said, and I beamed at the trace of pride in his voice. He was proud of me. I wouldn't let him down. Tsukumo's eyes drifted down to where I was peeking out from behind Papa's leg at him with wide eyes. He chuckled, giving me a warm smile as he squatted down in front of me. Hello there, he said. Hi. I gave him a small smile and, grasping onto my courage, stepped out from behind Papa's leg and held out my small hand towards him. My name is Aoka. His laugh was deep and loud, and I found myself entranced by the sound. I liked the sound of it. I liked him. He shook my hand gently, and I could practically feel the power and dexterity underneath the callouses on his palm and fingers. He could easily have broken my wrist with just a thought and twist of his hand. I liked how very aware of his power he was, of his restraint, he was being careful not to accidentally hurt me. Oh, I know who you are, Aoka-chan. Your Tusan never stops talking about you. I must have looked slightly panicky because he quickly adds in a conspiratorial whisper, all good things, I assure you. I beamed at him. Then I beamed at Papa. Tsukumo stood and the conversation drifted away from me to Kurinai, then to old training grounds and exercises that they used to use when they were at the academy. And how is your son, Tsukumo kun Mama inquired. Ah, yes. He's the reason I'm here today, actually. Is he starting at the academy too? I asked hopefully. I'd very much like to meet the son of a man as nice as Tsukumo. Well, actually he rubbed the back of his head, looking slightly self-conscious as he gives us a small smile. I'm here to speak to the Hokage about him. Hokage-sama wishes to promote him to Chknin, apparently he's made quite a splash compared to the other genin. Father's eyebrows rose in surprise, although it was Mama who spoke first. But isn't he only a year or two older than Aoka? A year younger than our Kurinai? Tsukumo nodded. Yes, he's only six years old, nearly seven. They want me to be present for when he signs the paperwork and waiver forms for the more dangerous missions he'll be taking as a Chknin. So the Chknin think it best if I am present when he signs it, in case he doesn't understand the seriousness of what he's signing. But I have full faith in my boy he understands what he's getting into. He started at the academy when he was just four years old, and the Hokage thinks that he's ready to make Chknin. No ordinary six-year-old makes Chknin. It's not hard to hear and envy the devotion and adoration present in Sakumo's words about his son. His son was only a year older than me and already was being promoted to Chknin. It was a little disheartening. I had been proud when Mama told me that only the advanced children get into the academy before the age of six, and here I was starting at five years old. He must really be something special. Congratulations, Sakumo. Just like a chip off the old block, eh? You must be very proud of him. Everyone. The morning tea has now finished. A young man likely a Chknin teacher at the academy called loudly over the sea of parents and children, interrupting any reply Sakumo could voice. He stood at the front of the room, his eyes dark and an expression of lazy indifference upon his face. The families outside must have joined us inside the building at some point because I noticed that the room is filled with people. You couldn't even walk two steps without bumping into someone. Could the children please follow me so that we can begin getting them settled into their classes? Although it was phrased like a question, it was spoken in a tone that was not to be brokered with. Without another word, he spun on his heel and marched through a door on the opposite side of the room. Giving Mama and Papa a quick hug and a wave to Sakumo, I darted through the crowd, blending into the group of kids making their way towards the door. The Chknin led us up a flight of stairs into an empty classroom. There were not enough seats in the classroom for us all to sit down, so many of us had to stand. 
By the time all the stragglers had made their way into the classroom my feet were aching, and I was seriously considering squeezing in between the two boys on the bench in front of me, just so that I could get off my feet. But I stayed put, Papa would have been disappointed if he found out that I was getting tired from just standing still, even if it had been almost half an hour. Alright, it seems like everyone is here now. The Chknin who had led us into the room said. My name is Takahata and I am one of the teachers at the academy. One of. I looked around and almost jumped. Several Chknin level shinobi were situated around the room and I hadn't heard them enter. The closest one was not even two meters away from me. I may not have been paying attention Papa would tear through me if I ever admitted that to him, but I should have been able to hear the shuffle of footsteps or clothing or anything. I guess this is just what it means to be a shinobi. I heard several students gasp as they too noticed the shinobi surrounding them, some even jumped to their feet yelping. It was slightly disheartening, although not entirely unexpected, to see that they were mostly civilian-born students. A dark-haired civilian boy actually tripped over, knocking over a desk and sending another group of students scrambling about. I turned my attention back to the Chknin, Takahata. His lips twitched, but that was as far to a smile as he seemed to allow. He cleared his throat, earning the attention of the room again. If we're quite finished here, I would like to move on, he said, giving a flat stare to the dark-haired boy, who cringed and turned a bright shade of pink. Let me be very clear about one thing before you begin your time at the academy. It will be hard work. And nothing is guaranteed. Even for the clan-born students, I've seen many cocky clan-born students who think that they are the cream of the crop just because of the emblem on their clothes. Let me be very clear about another thing I will not tolerate arseholes. There was a collective intake of breath from the kids around me at his cuss, and I heard the chknin behind me tut his disapproval at Takahata. But I liked him immediately. In this way, the academy is fair to all its students. We do not have favorites besides those that work hard and aim to serve the village with their very lives. As I said earlier this will not be easy, and I expect that not even a third of you brats will last to graduation. Brats. It seemed a little harsh, but I liked his blunt no-nonsense attitude, it was very different from the understanding and caring approach that Iruka Yamino would take with his future stud weight future students. Iruka Yamino. A heavy fog seemed to descend over my mind, and I struggled to retain my train of thought. But it had something to do with my past life, some half-forgotten memory that prodded around the back of my head, but was as hard to get a hold of as someone grasping at steam. I let the issue go and the stifling blanket of fog abruptly lifted, bringing my thoughts back into crisp clarity. How odd. I glanced around, half expecting half wondering if the fog was some sort of jinjutsu that everyone not just myself had fallen under. It didn't seem to be so. They were all looking forward, giving Takahata-sensei all of their attention. Just like I should be doing now. Takahata-sensei talked only for a little while longer, but in that short space of time insulted us in so large a variety of ways that I was making a game of picking up on them. We were up to 22 insults so far which included name calling such as brats, imps, or my personal favorite cocky shits finally, he reached the end of his speech, and just by looking at the chknin around the room, I could tell that about half were annoyed by Takahata's rudeness, whilst the other half were amused. I wondered if the teachers at the academy were conscripted to take up this job, it would certainly explain why Takahata and some of the other chknin were so seemingly averse to teaching us. Alright, dipshits. This is how it's going to work. 23. You're going to be divvied up into four classes. We have class lists already so we'll be calling out names. These classes will likely merge together at some stage in the future, when most of you hopeless cases 24 drop out and the class's size get too small to continue as a separate class. So listen close, because if you walk into the wrong class we'll kick you out of the academy. He had to be joking right? Three other chknin stepped forward, a scroll in their hands, and Takahata himself produced a scroll from his kunai pouch. They began speaking names all at once, four names said at the same time, and although it was hard to keep track of the names being said, it was even harder trying to determine which Nin had said which name, because they didn't pause or repeat any of the names again. They also didn't seem to be in any particular order alphabetical or otherwise. Ikiaka. I jumped from where I had been leaning against a wall and looked around, but the name my name had already slipped away, and others were already replacing it. I looked around at the chknin, but they were reading straight off of their scrolls, eyes downcast and personalities unapproachable. I had missed it. I had no idea which chknin had said my name. It could have come from the front of the room from Takahata, but I hadn't recognized the voice. Though that could just as likely be attributed to the fact that there were several people talking at once. I felt sick to the stomach. I had missed it. I had been unprepared Papa would be disappointed in me. As would Mama. I had let them both down within the first five minutes of being at the academy. No. No, no 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 no. Stay calm. I had to stay calm and focus. How could I figure out which class I was in? Asking the chknin was out of the question. 
I could ask another student, but I doubted that they would be able to hear their own name, let alone remember which Nin had spoken mine. So what did that leave me with? Father's voice echoed through my head. When one cannot obtain information through subtle means gossip, rumors and the like a shinobi must extract the information himself. Through less than subtle means. Seduction, torture, espionage, reconnaissance these are the true tools of a shinobi, more so than any blade or poison. Reconnaissance, I shifted quickly between the press of academy student bodies, making my way towards the nearest Chknin. I would just have to have a look at his list if I couldn't find out through other means. The Chknin in general didn't seem to be specifically on guard, in fact they seemed to be the cocky ones. But whatever. If the Chknin wanted to underestimate us I was fine with that. I flitted from Chknin to Chknin, checking each of their lists until I finally began to read the last list of students, just as I'd expected, I found my name on this list easily somewhere near the top and sticking out like a sore thumb, just as the Chknin finished calling out names. I was in Takahata's class. But lord. I liked him well enough, but I was sure that he'd caught me looking at least one of the other Chknin's lists. I just hoped he wouldn't kick me out for it. Hopefully he'd seen it for what it was a shinobi using their head to gather critical information. Either I'd stand out among my fellow classmates if he liked what I had done. Or I wouldn't stand among them at all. The latter was not an option. Boom. The wall near us imploded, raining mortar and plaster and dust into the room. The Chknin wasted no time in whipping out their kunai and ushering my fellow classmates to the opposite side of the room. The wall had been reduced to nothing more than rubble. Was this an attack? I could make out a single silhouette in the slowly calming cloud of debris and plaster dust that obscured our view of the enemy. They must be pretty stupid to target the academy that or they were targeting the weak. What a coward. Well, they were in for a surprise. I could already see the clan-born kid stepping into various offensive and defensive stances, anticipating a fight. Except that they were all safely at the back of the room and I was not. I had been behind Takahata standing closest to the wall that was now no more. The silhouette moved stepping into the room. I snatched a pen and threw it at the figure, like I had been trained to do with Kunai or Senban. Hey, bitches. I am Anko Mitarashi, the sexy ga. The little girl about my own age dived to the side to avoid the pen that had been thrown at her. It flew past her ear, her quick dive making the pen miss her by only a few centimeters. Oh. My. God. I had nearly just killed Anko Mitarashi. Who the hell threw that? Anko glared as she made her way back up to her feet. Her glare landed on me and I felt my face flush under her scrutiny. Perhaps leaping straight into battle with Anko Mitarashi of all people wasn't the best decision I could have made my first day at the academy. The punch came out of nowhere and clipped me under the chin before I could dart out of the way. My jaw stung from the impact as I backed up a few steps. No, she did not just punch me in the jaw. I opened and closed my mouth a few times like a goldfish, trying to work the pain out of my chin. Anko darted closer again and I moved into a sweeping kick, knocking her feet out from under her. She landed on the floor with a loud oomph. Dear God. I must have a death wish. Perhaps dying once had made me reckless. Whatever it was, knocking Anko to the ground would not end well for me. That's enough, girls. I turned. Takahata was standing over both of us with an indecipherable expression on his face. Anko Midrashi, yes? He asked, turning to Anko. Yes sir. She replied, clambering to her feet once more. You're in my class. And you. He turned to me. What's your name? Ayaka Iki. You're in my class too good. Wait was that a smile that flickered onto his face. Both of you follow me. The rest of my class, follow me also to our classroom. Anyone who gets it wrong is expelled from the academy. We marched through a pair of doors opposite to the wall that Anko had smashed through. How on earth had she broken through that wall though? Anko and I walked in silence directly behind Takahata Sensei. I felt flustered and nervous. Anko must hate me. God, I was probably on her shit list now. Did that mean I would be on Arachimaru's shit list too? My life was so over. I tried not to cry. I like you. My head whipped to face Anko so fast that my chin and jaw ached and my neck cracked. W what? I stuttered out. You're pretty cool. You've got some sweet moves. Anko's face broke out into a grin and she held out her fist towards me. What was she doing? What should I do? Was she asking me to fist bump her? Tentatively, I clenched my fist and touched it lightly to hers. Grinning, Anko jabbed her fist forward and our fists collided with a sharp crack. Ah damn it. I nearly howled. Don't cry. Don't you dare cry. She did that on purpose. But when I looked at Anko I couldn't see any sort of malevolence in her eyes, only her grin and the way that she stood closer to me suddenly. And just like that just like that I knew that she considered us best friends. And, oddly enough, I found that I was completely okay with that. It turns out that Takahata Sensei didn't actually have the authority to expel students from the academy, it seemed like he just liked to mess with our heads. 
He also made it very clear that should he ever wield the power to throw students out of the academy, he'd take great delight in abusing it to the fullest extent. By this stage I was positive that the job of teaching at the academy had to have been through some sort of conscription or perhaps punishment. I made a mental note to ask Papa later. There was no way that Takahata-sensei would have volunteered for this sort of a job. He made frequent references to his lousy pay. It seemed that that much wasn't different between this world and my old one. I wondered if he'd ever heard the saying if you're no good at it, teach it, I'm sure he would tear through anyone who would say that to his face. I couldn't help it. I giggled. Anko, who was sitting next to me in class, gave me a curious look, but I waved her off. Now was definitely not the time to explain something to Anko. Takahata-sensei was at the front of the class teaching us the fundamentals such as the concept of chakra, chakra coils, and the various types of jutsu that ninja used. Iki-chan. Takahata-sensei was suddenly bearing down on me, and I realized that perhaps it hadn't been the best idea to sit in the front row. Hi. I shot to my feet, nearly knocking over my chair in my haste. Perhaps you would like to share with the class what you find so funny. Not on my life. Ayano, yes. I was and nothing, sensei. I was sure that I was flushing a deep red, but he kept me pinned with his gaze, eyeing me closely. Sit back down and pay attention. He relinquished with a sigh, moving back to the board at the front of our classroom. Now, which of you little dickheads know how many tenketsu the human body has? I sat down back down. I felt Anko nudge me and I glanced at her. She gave me a pointed look and then looked at Takahata-sensei, then back at me, wiggling her eyebrow suggestively. No, she couldn't be insinuating, that was just wrong he could get in a lot of trouble how, could she just had she no shame? Was she even really aware of what she was implying? By the lewd grin on her face, I'd have to say yes, Anko Midarashi knew exactly what she insinuating. It didn't help that I blushed a deep red again. I was five years old, for Christ's sake. After Takahata-sensei's class, Anko and I made our way to our Kanoichi training lessons, which were usually held in either a small pretty training ground not far from Kanoha's gates, or on rainy days inside a regular academy classroom. On those wet days, the most fun we had was scouting out empty classrooms for our class to use and reporting them back to our teacher. Then we'd have a tea ceremony, where our teacher would talk us through the proper ways to prepare tea and who was to serve it in various scenarios. On sunny days, we'd go to our little training ground and pick wild flowers to arrange into artful bouquets. I didn't see any particular usefulness for this skill. It wasn't like there would ever be a scenario where a rogue ninja was holding a kunai to your throat and would kill you unless you made him the most beautiful flower bouquet in the world. It was, to be honest, a little sexist to make all the prospective kinoichi take these classes whilst the boys got the free time to train, wrestle, or do whatever else boys did when they weren't being annoying. And if it weren't for the in-depth details we were getting about poisons and how to ascertain which mushrooms were safe to eat and which plants could be mixed together to make an effective poultice for wounds, I would have complained to Papa a long time ago. But Anko loved the tea ceremonies. And I loved learning how best to slip a poison into those tea ceremonies. So although we both hated arranging flowers into bouquets, we decided that we'd both just have to put up with it. Hey Anko-san. MMM. I keep meaning to ask you, how did you get smashed through the academy classroom wall the first day that we started at the academy? I had been meaning to ask her for a while, ever since we'd first become friends all those weeks ago. Paper bombs? Oh. Well that made a lot of sense. How did you get your hands on those? We're not even allowed to even touch real kunai at the academy, let alone a paper bomb. Paper bombs? I had meh. I stole them off some genin punk who was swaggering around Kanoha like he owned the place. I stared at her. This was Anko's logic if she thought someone to be too cocky or stuck up, then she took it upon herself to give that person her personal brand of retribution. Wow, yup. There was a short pause in our conversation as we approached the other group of girls standing in the clearing for our Kinoichi classes. You're so cool, Anko-san. You're pretty sexy yourself. I made my own way home after those classes. I had split up from Anko after we had reached her apartment building. Our Kinoichi sensei insisted that we spend the afternoon picking wildflowers and arranging them into bouquets again to take back home with us and give to our families. Anko had taken to plucking the petals off of her flowers on the walk home, and so by the time we'd passed through the market district, her bouquet was nothing more than a bunch of green stalks clasped in her hand. She'd thrown them away shortly afterwards, where they accidentally smacked an old lady in the face. We spent the next hour trying to evade the surprisingly sprightly old lady's attempts to bring us to justice. And during all that running around and hiding from irate old woman, I still had my sad bouquet of flowers clutched tightly in my hand. Ayaka-chan. The greeting came from above, and I had just enough time to take a hesitant step backwards as Sakumo Haddock landed in front of me. He looked great for a man who would be dead within the next few years. Wait what? Sakumo wasn't going to die. Where had that thought come from? He was supposed to be as strong as the Sanin. 
who on earth could kill such a great shinobi? A series of images flashed through my head. Eyes narrowed with judgment, an isolated figure, a silver blade, a dark shape collapsed on bloodstained tatami mats. No this was from my old life. These images' memories belonged to me. Was this Akumo's sad fate? No, I couldn't let it end for him like this. It was unacceptable. I must have been born into this world for a reason, perhaps this reason was to help save lives. Lives like Sakumo's. Hello. Ayaka-chan. Please say something. Your dad will kill me if I frightened you to death, Sakumo. I snapped to attention. Ah. Haddock-sama. Good evening. Did you need something? He chuckled. Always so polite. I suppose I shouldn't expect anything different from the kids of a stiff neck like Kure. I was actually on my way to your home when I spotted you. And please, call me Sakumo. H hi, Sakumo-sama. No, I mean just call me sa ah, never mind. So what's a little squirt like you doing out so late? The academy should have finished ages ago. He began walking in the direction to my home, and I had to suddenly jog to keep up with him. Ah no I had my Kinoichi classes today. Ah, so that's why you're carrying around flowers, Sakumo said, gesturing to the bouquet in my hand. They look quite unoriginal. I glared at the badly presented bouquet and the sorry state of the flowers themselves. Ibarra had snatched the bouquet out of my hand and had kicked it like a ball until Anko had come and discouraged the mean-spirited little girl with a punch to the face. I won't lie, it had felt good to see. Really, really good. You don't have to lie, Sakumo-sama. They look terrible. I deadpanned. Well, not terrible terrible. Maybe more like an original terrible. An original terrible beauty. I'm sure that all the other girls in your class can't make a flower arrangement into a representation of such terrible beauty. It's an art form, really. He made it seem like he was paying me a compliment, but it was almost like he was only succeeding in digging upwards. Tsukumo kept talking and talking, and I'm sure that even he was aware that his rambling sentences weren't getting him anywhere. To be frank, if I even cared in the slightest about my bouquet, I might have been a little offended by some of the ill-thought-out compliments he was paying me. But they're really quite, Tsukumo-sama. Yes. You can stop talking now. His eyes crinkled as he gave me an apologetic smile. Sure. We continued walking, neither of us paying attention to the food stalls and the cacophony of raucous vendors shouting out offers for the various goods they sold in the hopes of luring in prospective clientele. Usually I was hassled a bit more when I walked through this part of the market district, but with Sakumo with hit I8 flak jacket and the kunai he was idly twirling around his index finger, no one seemed to want to catch our attention, much less approach us. It was handy. Although that it wouldn't be helpful when he was trying to do his shopping. Why, exactly, are you coming to our house, Sakumo-sama? I asked and then winced. I hadn't meant for my words to come out so direct and accusatory. Didn't your parents tell you? My son and I are having dinner at your home tonight. He smiled warmly at me. It's been a while since we've had a home-cooked meal. Your son? I vaguely remembered that the first time I had met Sakumo he had mentioned that he had had a son. He's Ichknin now, isn't he? I remember you mentioning that he was being promoted when we spoke on my first day at the academy. That's right. Sakumo's eyes practically glowed with pride. Where is he now? I looked around us as if expecting Sakumo's son to appear out of thin air. He's been going on a lot of missions lately. The amount of missions he's been doing is phenomenal. He barely has a moment to sit still before he's off on another mission. And that doesn't make you happy? I inquired. Sakumo's face had darkened and his eyes had fallen downcast in reverie as he had spoken and I could make out a trace of worry. Sadness. In his voice that pulled at my heartstrings. He wants to spend more time with his son. But when Sakumo looked up again that dark expression had lifted from his features and his face was back to neutral. He didn't get the chance to answer my question because, at that moment, we had reached my front door and Kur and I had come out in a flash, bounding into me. Mama is opening up a tea house. She crowed, hugging me as she jumped up and down. What? Nisan what? Mama is why would Mama open up a tea house I trailed off, rationally assessing the situation. Mama was a stay-at-home mother. She was always there she had to be if she wanted to look after us herself and not hire a babysitter or child day care services. Mama wasn't a fan of either, apparently. But now that Kur and I and I were at the academy most days of the week, I suppose that she no longer had to stay at home. She could return to the workforce. I knew that. I did. I had thought about it before, during the times that I noticed that she was getting restless at home. Though I had always just assumed that she would return to working as a kanoichi. I had heard stories of mothers that were so hell-bent on getting back into shinobi work that they'd leave for missions just days after giving birth to their baby. But never had I ever had an inkling that mama was thinking about opening her own tea house. From a kanoichi to a mother, then to become a tea house owner it quite a bit of a jump. Although, I suppose that if the Amanakas could own a flower shop, why couldn't the Ikis own a tea house? It didn't seem so far-fetched when I put it like that. 
so I laughed and jumped around hugging Kurinai and tried not to think about how ecstatic Anko would be once she heard the news. It was only after a short moment that Kurinai realized that I wasn't alone and, blushing furiously, invited Sakumo inside. I followed Kurinai and Sakumo into the dining area where we could see Mama bustling around the adjoining kitchen. I ran to her, hugging her tight, letting her know my excitement about her plans. And I was excited. What better way was there to practice slipping poisons into tea than in a tea house? Mama greeted Sakumo brightly before ushering him outside to where Papa apparently was sharpening his kunai in the shed towards the back of our property. I held out my bouquet towards Mama. Kasan, these are for you. Oh my, Mama breathed, looking at the bouquet from various angles. What an original design. I saw Sakumo give me a pointed look before slid the door closed and leave to find Papa. I hate Kinoichi class, I grumbled. But it's so easy, Kurinai burst out. It's pretty much just free time. No. It's a waste of free time. I griped. All the boys get to go do whatever they want eat dango, train, study, but we have to do stupid pointless things. Like collecting flowers and making tea. How is tea making supposed to help me in the middle of a fight? Maybe you throw the tea at them Kurinai giggled. I glared at her. Now, now, Ayaka-chan. Mama said patiently, turning back to the oven where she was turning over the sori she was grilling for dinner. Sorry. We never have sori. Your kinoichi lessons aren't supposed to be about fighting head-on. They're used for teaching you skills that a civilian would know. Why do we have to learn civilian skills, Kasan? Kurinai asked, standing beside me as Mama continued to bustle around the kitchen. They come in handy in missions where seduction and espionage is required. If the enemy were able to tell that a kinoichi from an enemy village was snooping around their business, then you would be an easy target to eliminate. But disguise yourself as a civilian working in a flower shop or for a tea house, and Mama trailed off, leaving us to draw up our own conclusions. And Kurinai began. And then you're disguised as an ordinary person. Exactly, Mama praised. And why would we want to be able to be disguised as an ordinary person? I had this one. So that we blend in and are above suspicion. Correct, she praised once again. You'll find that often women are weaker than men. Even most Kanoichi are physically weaker than male shinobi. At our scandalized look she quickly added, although, we are also more likely to be underestimated, which, in itself, is more than capable of allowing us to win in a fight. Mama looked upwards and smiled at someone standing in the doorway. Kurinai and I whirled around to find both Sakumo and Papa standing in the entryway to the kitchen, both looking amused at our reaction to their silent approach. You should have seen how badly your mother used to beat me into the ground, Papa said, moving forward and kissing Mama. But, of course, I won in the end. Kurinai and I gaped at him. Mama had beaten Papa that badly. It was impossible to contemplate, Papa was such a strong shinobi, and Mama was was, well, was bustling around the kitchen in a faded floral apron. I could never imagine that the woman making us dinner who had always made us dinner could beat up a jimin like Papa. And suddenly, Mama's point about being able to blend in with civilian skills made sense. You were such a sore loser, Kure. Mama said, her eyes fluttering coquettishly, her smile turning a little too sharp. Wait. Were they flirting? Oh my god. My eyes. They're burning. Kill it. Kill it with fire. I howled clutching at my eyes, while Kure and I made small gagging sounds. I stumbled up to Sakumo and clutched onto his leg tightly. Take me away from here. I begged. Don't make me live with with these people. Oh, stop being such a drama queen, Mama admonished whilst Sakumo howled with laughter, bending over forwards and putting his hands on his knees. His laughter continued for several seconds before they faded into chuckles and hiccups. Seeing me still clinging to his leg, Sakumo scooped me up and sat me on his shoulder, chuckling softly. I felt like a queen gazing down at her subjects. I grinned down at Kurinai's pouting, envious face. How's the view from up there, Ayakaheim? Sakumo asked. I looked at Kurinai pouting and my parents' grins before replying that it was in my most pompous take of grandmama's voice adequate, everyone laughed again. You sound like Basan. Kurinai called. Appa glared at her. Father, we all started at the voice coming from behind Sakumo, and I Sakumo turned so quickly that I nearly fell off his shoulder. The boy around Kurinai's age stood at her open back door, in easy view of the antics going on in the kitchen and dining room. He stood only a little taller than Kurinai did, but had a shock of silver-gray hair on his head, and a mask from his uniform stretched over the lower half of his face. And without ever seeing this boy before I knew exactly who he was. Although the color of his hair was a dead giveaway, I felt like I knew him from somewhere. I couldn't shake the feeling that I knew him very, very well. But, of course, that would be ridiculous. The Kashi Sakumo said, the smile slipping from his face. I suddenly felt very uncomfortable sitting on Sakumo's shoulder as the boy's Kakashi's dark expressionless eyes slid over from his father to me then back again. Even I, the least trained shinobi in the room, could tell that he was noting down and processing everything he saw. 
in that one moment of silence I felt every little thing about me every nervous tick and out of place hair being evaluated. I didn't even notice that I was shuffling uncomfortably on Sakumo's shoulder until he lifted me again and deposited me on the ground. Sakumo cleared his throat and moved towards Kakashi, before turning to face my parents. Kurei, Kagura-san. This is my son, Kakashi. Kakashi, this Kurei and Kagura-san, and their daughters Kurenai-chan and Ayaka Haim. He added the honorific to my name in a painfully obvious attempt to lighten the mood. Suddenly nervous, I shuffled forward to meet the boy. This was Sakumo's son, and I had promised myself that I would make friends with him as best I could. I smiled at him broadly. Hi, I'm Ayaka. Sakumo-sama has told me so much about you, Kakashi-kun, I introduced, proffering my hand out to him. I waited for him to reply and shake my hand for him to smile and say that it was a pleasure to meet me too. That Sakumo had spoken of me also. That he'd been looking forward to becoming friends with me. And waited, and waited, had I been too overly familiar by calling him Kakashi-kun. Perhaps I should have started with Kakashi-san, instead. Or maybe I should have just gone completely formal with Hattik-san. And why was he just staring at me? For an uncomfortably long moment my hand just stayed held out in front of me and susceptible to Kakashi's gaze and judgment where he was staring down at my proffered hand. I managed to catch his gaze and a flash of intense dislike cross his feature. It surprised me so much so that I stumbled back a step. My hand fell. Kakashi. Sakumo scolded harshly. What's gotten into you? Kakashi turned to his father, his face blank. Forgive me, father. I don't feel well. I don't want to spoil your evening so I'll go. Wait, mama said, moving forward quickly. You're welcome to stay. I'm making salt broiled sorry, your father tells me it's your Kakashi, you're not going anywhere, Sakumo commanded, placing a restricting hand on Kakashi's shoulder. You're going to apologize to Ayaka here, as well as to Kagura-san and Kurei for your rudeness inside their home. Kakashi looked at the floor and scuffed his feet uncomfortably. Mama opened her mouth. Sakumo-san, an apology isn't is entirely necessary, Kagura, Papa cut in. He was looking down at Kakashi quietly, his anger only evident in his eyes and the puckering corners of his lips. It gave me shivers. The last time I had seen him this mad was when I had graffitied his bingo book by drawing devil horns, mustaches and lipstick over the faces of most of the criminals in it. I had thought it hilarious at the time, though after the punishment that had followed, I would not be hurrying to do that again. Appa turned away from Mama to face Kakashi. You were invited into my house, where my wife was preparing your favorite dish for dinner, and have the audacity to insult my daughter under my own roof. I'm sorry, Sakumo, but I feel like your son does owe my family an apology for his rude behavior in the 60 seconds that he's been on my property. I turned to Papa horrified. I didn't want Kakashi to apologize to me, I just wanted to be friends. You couldn't force a friendship. No, no. I agree Kurei. I'm sorry that your wife went to so much trouble for my son, Sakumo said. Oh no, Sakumo-san. It was no trouble. Mama protested. I apologize for my misconduct, everyone. Everyone's eyes fell on Kakashi, and he swallowed audibly. He scuffed his foot again nervously before stepping in front of me and offering his hand to me. I'm sorry for my rudeness, Iki-san. I hesitated a heartbeat before grasping his hand in mine. You can just call me Ayaka, I said, glad to have the awkward tension broken. But his body language spoke volumes. He remained indifferent and although his tone was polite, it held only mild disinterest. He was uncomfortable. Appa gave Kakashi one final glare before relenting. Okay. Now that that's over, who wants to help me set the table? I'm guessing the sori is nearly finished, Kagura. Mama's face fell. The sori. She raced back into the kitchen and, as she opened the oven, the smell of our burnt dinner reached my nose. An awkward silence fell over the room and Kakashi shifted uncomfortably in front of me. After a moment, Mama came out of the kitchen, smiling brightly. Both Sakumo and Papa tensed at the fake brightness of her smile. Is everything all right, honey? Papa started cautiously. Mama turned him and he took a step back. Of course. She grinned. Most of the sori will be fine. You, however, and Ayaka-chan will have to undergo some endurance training during dinner tonight. Papa vainly tried not to wince. What? I burst out. What did I do wrong? Mama head rotated slowly to look at me, and the hair on the back of my neck stood on end in response. Her grin had suddenly turned sadistic. Ah. Kurei. Sakumo said, lifting a hand to cover the small smile adorning his face. I glared at him. I was actually hoping to see Kurenai undergo some training. You've already said that she has a natural aptitude for Jinjutsu, and I've heard that her Jujutsu techniques are flawless. He smiled at Kurenai, who ducked her head and blushed faintly. Sure, we'll go outside. Papa said, shepherding us all away from Mama. Kurenai does have a natural aptitude for Jinjutsu. It's nothing short of amazing how she has been able to pick up techniques so well. 
we assembled in the small clearing and backyard where Kurinai and I usually performed our morning exercises and katas. Oh to san. I dashed forward and glomped his leg. Can I join in too? Yeah. Kurinai agreed, jumping onto Papa's other leg. Papa frowned. I don't think that that's a why not? Kurinai pouted, letting go of Papa's leg, she put her hands on her hips and lifted her chin. I could use a partner. And Aoka's not that far behind me. She started at the academy a year earlier than I did. He looked down at me and I gazed up at him, giving him my best puppy dog look. I added in a quivering bottom lip for extra effect. Mon, Kure, Sakuma laughed. The girl seemed determined. The Kashi remained silent next to his father, watching. When Papa sighed through his nose I knew that we had won. All right. A single spar. Tijutsu only, Kurinai. Your sister doesn't know much else besides that. He turned to me. Ayaka, don't be discouraged if you're beaten, okay? There's no shame in losing to your sister she's had a lot more training than you. Just remember, whoever loses gets kicked out of the family and has to live in shame forever. Mama cheered from the kitchen window. You're not helping, Kagura. Love you too, darling. Ignore your mother, Ayaka, Papa said, sounding only a little exasperated. What I was going to say was remember how to dodge. I nodded and excitedly clapped hands with my sister. Papa looked between the two of us. Tijutsu only. Gurunai rolled her eyes. We know, Otu-san. We heard you the first time. Gurunai and I backed up from each other before we both slid into mirror image stances, our feet shoulder width apart and our arms lifted to guard our faces. We stood like that, making eye contact, and then I blinked and Kurinai was moving forward, her leg rising to present a high roundhouse kick to my head. I hit the ground and rolled out of the way, quickly clambering back to me feet. Kurinai was already rushing at me again. I blocked her right cross with my shoulder and followed up with a quick jab that would have smacked into her nose had she not quickly backed up. Her guard opened up as her arms spread too wide. Pressing the offensive, I darted forward and landed a snap kick straight to her chest. She fell backwards onto her back but swept a leg out and took me down with her. I landed on my tailbone. Hard. I needed to go over my falls with Papa once this was over. Her and I was back on her feet in a flash and I found that I was still struggling to get my feet beneath me. Her snap kick sent me sprawling backwards into the grass again. I stayed down. I was panting and perspiring slightly, though not from exertion. If anything I felt full to the brim with energy. But before I could even attempt to get up, Kurinai was above me, her leg raised to deliver a devastating axe kick. Her form was perfect, I'm sure Papa was proud of her. Unlike me. I loved my sister dearly, but I was envious of everything she had that I did not. She was Papa's pride. Top of her class in Jinjutsu. Her katas had been perfected. She was older and prettier than me. Stronger than me too. What could I do? I was second rate compared to her. There was a small sensation at the back of my skull, like many hands tickling the back of my brain. Thinking quickly, I gathered my meager reserves of chakra to perform the jinjutsu I had been practicing in my room for the past few weeks. I would show them that I was capable too. Jinjutsu? After image. I rolled out of the reach of Kurinai's leg before she could bring it down, leaving behind an image of my prone form as she brought her heel down on my form. Her foot slides straight through the illusion and slammed into the earth, kicking up a small cloud of dirt. She looked down bemusedly for a moment before she looked up to see me climbing to my feet a short distance away from her. Do you use Jinjutsu? She seemed delighted by the prospect. And proud. I grinned at her, my stomach flooding with warmth. The tickling sensation was now spidering throughout my head, sharp hot burning wires of pain spreading fire, and the hand scraping along my scalp with invisible claws. I winced. It hurt. Her and I moved forward again, but stuck only to Tijutsu, and I suddenly found myself on the defensive. A punch bounced off of my collarbone and I grunted. Neither of our attacks was chakra enhanced, otherwise her attacks would be doing a whole lot more damage to me. It was all I could do to bring my hands up to fend off the blows that Kurinai rained down upon me. My head was on fire. I couldn't think. I couldn't concentrate or keep up with Kurinai's attacks. Something struck me under the chin and I flew backwards. I was so out of it that I didn't even know if it was a fist from an uppercut that had hit me or a foot from a jump kick. Pain exploded from behind my eyes and the hands in my head clawed into my eyes. Everything went black. No, that wasn't quite right. Everything had gone dark, smudged, but I could still make out Papa, Kurinai and the others as I managed to climb to my feet once again. It all looked the same, yet everything looked different. I couldn't see their distinctive features, but I could feel them. Their individual warmths. Like a cold blind man could feel the warmth from a light bulb. The hands twitched and twisted restlessly, aching to reach out to their warmth. To strew it about. To render it to its very foundations. They were evil. The hands scared me. They fed off of my chakra supply, and I felt my reserves plummet, like water in a bathtub, getting sucked down a drain. The hands only had a short opportunity to tear to shred before the chakra they thrived on ran out. 
Gurunai was suddenly in front of me, spinning and about to bring home another roundhouse kick that would land in my side. And I reached out, drawn by some incomprehensible magnetism, and placed my fingers to her forehead. The hands crawled forward, clambering over each other in haste into the golden knot of sparking threads that emanated the warmth I could sense pressing against me. She froze. Her body literally stopped, frozen in the pirouette that would deliver her roundhouse to my kidney. I quivered. I could feel the hands in her mind, cutting strings, reattaching them here and there. Plucking, tugging, strumming the strings almost playfully. Then their nails dug in and the tearing began. Her and I screamed and I felt the pain as though it were my own. As though my head were being to torn into pieces, not by two hands but by twenty, two hundred, two thousand. I clutched my hands to my head and screamed alongside her. Broken sentences and exclamations made themselves known to me ears briefly before I was deafened in overwhelming waves of pain. Gurunayaka going on. Happening. Speak. My chakra ran out and the hands dissipated. I collapsed. I couldn't see and there was a heavy weight on my chest pressing down, but that was okay, I couldn't feel any pain either. What I could feel was the foreboding burning sensation in the back of my mind. I blacked out. Bakashi had arrived early. Having managed to finish his patrol early thanks to a favor he'd been owed, he had only stopped to double check where he was headed before he made his way to the Iki residence. The house itself was average in size, much like the home he and his father lived in. It had a large backyard though, with a small koi pond in one corner and a large clearing in the center, where the family no doubt practiced their jutsu or morning exercises. The Kashi had never met anyone from the Iki family before, but his father seemed to have a deep respect for Kurei Iki the head of the family and seemed to consider him a friend. He had been surprised to say the least when his father had told him that they would be having dinner at someone else's home. A home-cooked meal was definitely an opportunity for excitement. His father wasn't really much of a cook, and the last time that Kakashi had tried to buy ingredients to make dinner, he'd been laughed out of the market district because apparently the prospect of the five-year-old doing the grocery shopping was just too funny to leave alone. So the Haddock family had continued their consumption of takeaway and frozen meals for the entirety of their dietary needs, although Kakashi had always wished, just once, that he could come home and find his father home and a fresh home-cooked meal waiting on the dinner table. The corners of his lips puckered down underneath his mask as he body flickered to sit on the branch of a tree across the road from the house to wait. He'd wait until his father arrived and then they'd enter together as father and son. Like a real family. But it wasn't to be, he realized, watching his father arrive at the house with a small, dark-haired girl in tow. She was short shorter than him, at least and a little younger than himself, also. Bakashi didn't know who she was, but he felt his insides turn cold as he watched the way his father indulgently smiled at her. Seeming to dote on her. They traded words, and his father actually seemed interested in what she had to say. As if she had some wisdom to impart. It made him angry. And hurt. There was no way that she could be a gen and she wore no hit I ate, so she must be an academy student. A young academy student, judging by her looks, but Kakashi himself had been younger when he'd been admitted into the academy. And he was a chnin now. What could she possibly be saying to his father that made his face darken in silent reflection? Who was she? His questions were answered when an older girl, quite obviously the young girl's sister, ran out of the house and began chattering excitedly to the two of them. So they were Ikis. The older girl had the same basic features as her younger sister except older. They had the same pale skin, same dark hair, and although he couldn't make out the color from his distance, they probably had the same colored eyes too. He watched as the older girl led his father into their home, with the younger sister trailing after, closing the front door behind her. So much for a united front, he stayed in the tree for a while longer, weighing up whether or not he should actually turn up or just go home and mope. Moping sounded good. But his father had wanted him to come, he had said as much. But Kakashi certainly didn't feel welcome. He hadn't even met the family, and already he felt like they wouldn't take too well to him being in their home. He could imagine them. He could imagine his father. Talking animatedly with each other, but refusing to acknowledge his presence as anything more than an inconvenience. A nuisance. He deserved more than that didn't he? Moping alone at home definitely seemed like a good plan. But he'd told his father that he would go and he hated to disobey him. To disappoint him. Perhaps perhaps if he just had a peek of what was happening inside, then he could make his decision. Yes. That sounded okay. He would just take a quick look and if he liked what he saw he would introduce himself and hopefully spend a pleasant afternoon with his father. If not well, he'd figure it out. Dropping down from the tree, he slipped around the side of the house to the backyard. Silently, he moved to the sliding door at the back of the house, where he could hear the voices inside. Don't make me live with with these people. A high voice cried dramatically. He didn't know for sure, but he was certain that it was the young girl he had watched with his father before, though it could just as easily been her sister. Oh, stop being such a drama queen, a woman admonished, likely the girl's mother. 
He felt sick to the stomach as he heard his father's unfamiliar chuckling laugh. He never seemed to laugh when Kakashi was around apparently a part of himself was masochistic because he slid the door open to watch the scene unfold. It wouldn't destroy him, Kakashi told himself. It wouldn't mean that his father loved him less than he loved someone else's child. It didn't hurt. Most of them were gathered in the room that the door he was at opened into, except for a woman he saw through a doorway in what he recognized as a kitchen. A dark-haired man around his own father's age stood near the two dark-haired girls he had seen out the front of the house. Kakashi watched as his father laughed and scooped the younger girl up in his arms and sat her on his shoulder. How's the view from up there, Ayaka Haim? He asked, grinning broadly. Kakashi felt a knife twist into his heart. He had never seen his father act so carefree and unfatherly. Perhaps he didn't want Kakashi for a son, but would rather prefer this Ayaka girl as a daughter. The young girl, Ayaka, sniffed prudishly. Adequate, she replied with temerity, looking down her nose at the people in the room. She took his father's gesture of affection for granted, he realized. Didn't she understand how valuable that was? Didn't she know that he desperately longed for that kind of closeness with his own father? And as everyone in the room laughed at their antics, Kakashi found himself getting colder and angrier. His fists clenched but he made his face remain passive. How could this girl be showered with the affection from his father that he had always craved? How could she not know how special that was? Why? Wasn't he good enough? He'd always obeyed his father. He'd always admired and been in awe of him. His father was a powerful shinobi, and Kakashi was proud to be his son. But, Kakashi wondered clenching his fists tighter, was Sakumo proud to be his father? Father, everyone in the room whirled to face him, apparently he had spoken aloud. Kakashi watched as the smile slipped from his father's face as his gaze landed on him, and he stilled. Kakashi he muttered in quiet surprise, taking the girl off of his shoulder and placing her back on her feet. The girl. He could see her properly now, her and her sister. He could see the slight differences between them, the elder sister's face was sharper, with more angles, whilst Ayaka's was more rounded, smoother. But otherwise they were the same. The younger girl shifted uncomfortably under his gaze, and her red eyes flicked downwards shyly. Red eyes, Ichiha. He nearly spoke the word aloud but caught himself. They were Iki, not Ichiha. The family with the demon eyes, people called them, and Kakashi stared at them further, dissecting the details in his head. They were red with an additional red iris surrounding the original, making them seem to pulse a little bit like a visual illusion. Civilians treated them with a little bit of scorn because their eyes had no reason to be red, they were simply just a decorative and unique feature to their faces. The Haika's eyes at least made sense. They were Dinjutsu and served a purpose on the battlefield. The Sharingan for the Ichiha was the same. The Iki eyes had no such excuse. The sound of his father clearing his throat brought Kakashi back to reality, he kept his expression void of emotion. Hooray, Kagura-san. Father began, moving towards Kakashi before turning to face the family. This is my son, Kakashi. Kakashi, this is Kurei and Kagura-san, and their daughters Kurenai-chan and Ayaka Haim. His chuckle was obviously forced, and his attempt to lighten the mood was failing dismally. Kakashi was having none of it. The younger of the two girls stepped forward nervously, eyes darting between looking at the floor and him. Pausing in front of him, she took a deep breath and smiled widely. Hi, I'm Ayaka. Sakumo-sama has told me so much about you, Kakashi-kun, she chirped, holding out her hand for him to shake. She was waiting for him to take it, waiting for him to smile and laugh and pretend that it didn't bother him that his father enjoyed talking to this girl over himself. So he stared and waited for her to take the hint. And waited. And waited. He was beginning to think that perhaps she had been frozen like that when her smile faded and her hand fell by her side. Kakashi. His father scolded, frowning down at him. What's gotten into you? I'm sick of being made to look like a fool. He looked up at his father, replying evenly, forgive me, father. I don't feel well. I don't want to spoil your evening so I'll go. He'd rather be moping in his bedroom. Wait, the woman Ayaka's mother said, hurrying out of the kitchen. You're welcome to stay. I'm making salt broiled sorry, your father tells me it's your A hand clamped down on Kakashi's shoulder. Kakashi, you're not going anywhere. His father commanded. You're going to apologize to Ayaka here, as well as to Kagura-san and Kurei for your rudeness inside their home. Kakashi looked to the floor, scuffing his feet slightly. He'd been perfectly polite in the phrasing of his words, so Kakashi didn't understand why he had to apologize. He had made sure his tone had been perfectly brokered if a little clipped. The woman Kagura huffed slightly. Sakumo-san, an apology isn't is entirely necessary, Kagura. The dark-haired man Ayaka's father, Kurei cut in. He was looking down at Kakashi, and Kakashi could feel the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Perhaps angering this man hadn't been his wisest move. You were invited into my house, where my wife was preparing your favorite dish for dinner, and have the audacity to insult my daughter under my own roof. 
I'm sorry, Sakumo, but I feel like your son does owe my family an apology for his rude behavior in the 60 seconds that he's been on my property. Did he really come off as being that rude? Although, it wasn't like Kakashi had made any considerable effort to be amiable. Or any effort at all. No wonder the man was angry. No, no. I agree Kurei. I'm sorry that your wife went to so much trouble for my son, his father said. Oh no, Sakumo-san. It was no trouble. Kagura protested. Kakashi would be lying if he'd said that he didn't feel even a little chastened by the fact that the family had actually been expecting him, even going so far as to cook his favorite dish. Perhaps he did owe them all an apology. I apologize for my misconduct, everyone. He said, scuffing his shoes on the floor again, looking down. Then he stepped forward to Ayaka and held out his hand. I'm sorry for my rudeness, Iki-san. She hesitated only a moment before taking it, her grip weak. You can just call me Ayaka, she said. Kakashi wasn't sure how to feel about that. He didn't want to remain rude, but he didn't particularly want to befriend this father-stealing little girl either. Bure gave Kakashi one last pointed look before turning back to face everyone. Okay. Now that that's over, who wants to help me set the table? I'm guessing the sori is nearly finished, Kagura. Kagura's face fell. The sori. She raced back into the kitchen, and the smell of burned sori flooded the room. Kakashi's face fell slightly. It was his entire fault. He distracted them with his stupid behavior. But they seemed okay with the fact that half their dinner had been ruined, and no one brought up that he was likely responsible for it happening. No one so much as looked at him funny. It was almost nice. Tsukumo asked Kurei to show him what Kurenai had been learning, which soon escalated into the two Iki girls having a tojutsu only spar. Bakashi watched, face impassive, next to his father as Ayaka and Kurenai faced each other. He wasn't personally invested in the match he wasn't rooting for either girl, but he was interested to see how far two members of the same family would take a sparring match. It wasn't like Kakashi had a brother or sister of his own to spar against. Gurei looked between the two of them. Tujutsu only, he reiterated. Gurenai rolled her eyes. We know, Otu-san. We heard you the first time. The two sisters stepped back into identical fighting stances. They stood still for only a moment, eyeing each other off before they suddenly moved. Gurenai ran forward first. It was an eager move. Her feet landing too heavily on the ground, and she was very slow also. Her guard opened up and allowed an easy striking target that Ayaka took advantage of. Kakashi's eyes lifted as he watched the younger sister snap a kick into the other girl's chest, watching as Kurenai fell backwards. Short of chakra enhancing their hits, it seemed like there was going to be no hits barred. Kurenai's legs snaked out and swept Ayaka's feet out from under her, where she landed awkwardly on her tailbone. In a flash, Kurenai was back on her feet again as her sister struggled to collect herself. Another snap kick from Kurenai sent Ayaka flying backwards into the grass again. Bakashi couldn't say that he was particularly impressed. He was leaps and bounds ahead of these two. Ayaka stayed down, panting heavily. It was pitiable that she was apparently so drained already. It wouldn't be good for her shinobi career if she couldn't last long in a fight. Kurenai darted over to her prone form again, sweeping her leg upwards into an axe kick that would, at the very least, fracture bone. Bakashi noticed from the corner of his eye that his father had started forward, intending to intervene in the spar before Ayaka could get hurt, but Kurei held his arm out in front of him, effectively halting him. Bakashi watched on. He didn't notice it until it had already happened, Kurenai's leg sliding through what was quite obviously a jinjutsu. Ayaka stood a little while away, panting heavily. She really did have to work on her stamina, though the fact that she pulled off the jinjutsu in such a way that not even he had noticed it showed that she perhaps wouldn't be a completely dud shinobi. Do you use Jinjutsu? Kurenai said, seemingly delighted. Kakashi frowned. Ayaka had cheated, why would Kurenai be happy about that? Ayaka grinned at her sister, then winced, pressing a hand to her temple as if her head hurt. But Kurenai was moving forward again. Ayaka was hard pressed to keep up with her sister, it was all she could do to block not dodge or even counterattack, just block her sister's onslaught of attacks, and before he knew it, Ayaka was falling backwards, hands clutching her head. She stumbled to her feet again, just as Kurenai rushed at her with a roundhouse kick. The Kashi's skin prickled. Something suddenly felt very off. The intensity of Ayaka's chakra was all wrong, and not just wrong different too. He wasn't a sensor nin, so he couldn't tell more than what his gut told him, and it was telling him that Ayaka's chakra was plummeting, as if feeding a jutsu. Which couldn't be right. She was just standing there, her hands clutching at her head. No hand signs. No anything. Just a face that was bunched up in pain. Then her face slackened. Kakashi couldn't see her eyes from where he stood, but the rest of her body seemed to waver also, and for a moment he thought she was going to faint. But then she darted forward, skimming inside the range of Kurenai's kick, and pressed two fingers to Kurenai's forehead. Kakashi couldn't breathe as Ayaka's chakra flared and Kurenai froze, her body seemingly stuck in the middle of her kick. 
he didn't know what to what to make of it. Beside him, his father and Kurei went still, not daring to breathe as they felt the daunting quality that Ayaka's chakra had adopted. Akashi himself again, not the best chakra sensor could almost see the chakra flowing down Ayaka's arm and into Kurenai's head. It was so faint that it was almost impossible to perceive its color or if it had a color at all. Then the screaming began. First Kurenai, then Ayaka. One stuck in an off-putting and uncomfortable stance, the other clutching at her head. Kurei ran forward and I saw Kagura sprinting from the house towards her daughters. Kurenai. Ayaka. What's going on? She cried. Gray ignored her and reached his daughters, catching Ayaka as her chakra emptied to a frightening level, and she toppled forward. Tsukumo caught Kurenai as her body sagged. Gray. What's happening? What happened? Kagura hollered again, reaching her daughters. Speak to me. Ayaka. Kurei shouted at his daughter's prone form. She was empty, or at least close to. If she weren't taken to the hospital she could quite easily die from chakra exhaustion. We need to get them to the hospital, Tsukumo said, lifting Kurenai into both of his arms. I'll clear the way and inform the emergency room, Kakashi informed, before racing to the hospital. This was always a problem with having children trained to use their chakra so young, Kakashi thought as he darted away to the hospital to inform them of the two new incoming patients. Children below the age of six had only a meager supply of chakra, so little in fact that Kakashi had heard that during the Second Shinobi War, it wasn't uncommon for young children to die from chakra exhaustion, from just using chakra to run to the battlefield. It was a dangerous world out there. But, of course, he knew that. And in the midst of all the chaos of what had happened, Kakashi found a silver lining. At least he wasn't helpless, like she was. At least he wasn't useless. It was the light from an early rising sun that awoke me, jarring my mind into consciousness. My own fault, no doubt. I mustn't have closed the blinds the night before. The sun was warm, though, and I had to admit that waking to the rising sun did feel a lot more poetic than an alarm clock. Speaking of alarm clocks, I rolled over and checked the time. 6.08. My alarm wouldn't be going off for a while yet. But still, I was awake. I should probably start getting my stuff together. Today was an important day, after all. The body next to me stirred and I giggled as a hand snuck out from under the mound of blankets to snatch my wrist before I could go very far from the bed. Whammies it. Came a muffled mutter from beneath the blankets before Shane's head appeared out from beneath the mound. With his bleary eyes and must hair, I couldn't help but reach over and try to pat it down. It's nearly ten past six, I said, stepping away and attempting to gently tug my hand back, but his grip remained firm. He scowled. This is a... Uh. He stopped for a moment to yawn, bringing up his other hand to cup in front of his mouth. This is ridiculous. Come back to bed. I rolled my eyes. Come on, Shane. You know I need to go into the university today. MMM. Why's that? I felt the urge to roll my eyes again. I have to present my dissertation to Professor Godfrey today to see the hand see one. Shane pulled himself out of his nest of blankets which he had pulled from me during the night, honestly the man was just as bad as a child and sat up against the headboard. What does that even mean? I asked, perhaps a little too sharply. He blinked at me innocently too innocently. He's the one who likes to be a little too familiar with his PhD students, isn't he? Maybe I acquiesced. But it's a harmless thing. You know, like an old man in a home pinching a nurse's bottom. He doesn't mean anything by it. His look turned cutting. He's pinched your bottom. I laughed again and leaned over to place a kiss on his forehead. Nothing like that, I promise. I pulled back. Now, stop being so possessive and go make me some breakfast. And a sandwich. You like it when I'm possessive. He said. His eyes turning mischievous for a second before his face morphed into his very best puppy dog face, his eyes gazing up at me innocently. How about you come back to bed and I make you something else? No. No way. Not today. I don't want to be running late. I need to be on top of things today. I walked over to the dressing table and began picking out clothes for me to wear for the day. His big brown eyes blinked at me sadly. You could be on top of me too. No. Are you sure? Yes. Yes, you'll be on top. He asked hopefully. No. So you want to me to be on top? I'm going to kill him. I was truly going to kill him. Neither. No snuggles for you this morning. Please. Stop it. It's not going to happen. And that's that. I stomped my foot for good measure. God damn it. I hate you. I raced around the room picking up my strin about clothing. Shane gazed up at the ceiling, his hands behind his head with the biggest, smuggest grin on his face that I had ever seen. I'm probably going to be late because of you. Meh. I don't mind. He said, turning over in our bed to watch me dash around, his eyes following me almost lazily. Of course you don't. Where were my blasted socks? Some of us actually have to get up before 9am to get to our jobs. Isn't that a shame? You should probably start rethinking your career choice if it's going to be like this all the time for my sake. 
That self-satisfied grin was still on his face. Shut up, I snapped. I finally found and retrieved my pair of socks from where they had been a hem kicked under the bed. I didn't look at Shane's face again as I shuffled into the bathroom. I slammed the door behind me though, locking it for good measure. I didn't need Shane getting any more ideas. After having my long overdue shower, I found Shane preparing breakfast as I stepped into the adjoined dining room. Nothing special, Shane called over the hiss of the frying pan. Just bacon and some scrambled eggs. Oh good. I replied, sitting down to put on my shoes. How's my sandwich coming along? He half turned to face me. You were serious about that? Always am. He scoffed and turned back to the pan. You know, he began. Since you never watch the man we're running out of space, I think you should consider getting rid of your anime collection. Never. No hesitation. But at least just over my dead body. No hesitation there, either. I was quite proud of myself. He sighed. At least take a look. You don't have to get rid of all of them. We can even just move some of your less favorite ones up into the ceiling, just so we can. This time it was turned to sigh. May the and I'm gods forgive me, but I was okay with that compromise. Fine but don't blame me if I'm hostile towards you for the next few weeks. He turned to face me, his lips tugging into a slight smirk. I think I can manage. Prick I muttered, standing up. I heard that. I moved into our matchbox-sized living room and went straight for the shelf holding our DVD collections. There were several DVDs belonging to Shane and a few games that he played, but most belonged to me. TV shows like Bones, The Mindy Project and Supernatural, some cartoon series including The Legend of Korra, a ton of anime series like Bleach, Soul Eater, Naruto, Naruto, that word. There was something about it. Something about that one word that raised some flags. Something wasn't quite right about it. Sure, I remembered watching the series many years ago, laughing at Naruto's antics, getting annoyed at Sasuke's overall character, wanting to throttle Sakura for her uselessness, chuckling at Kakashi's fanatical fascination with the Icha Icha series. Wait. Bakashi. The boy around Kurinai's age stood at her open back door, an easy view of the antics going on in the kitchen and dining room. He stood only a little taller than Kurinai did, but had a shock of silver gray hair on his head, and a mask from his uniform stretched over the lower half of his face. And without ever seeing this boy before I knew exactly who he was. The images and thoughts almost like memories slammed unbidden into my mind, and I physically stooped under their invisible weight. They seemed too much like memories. And why had I thought about Kurinai? Kurinai wasn't even an important character to the series. The show only ever showed her in one or two fight scenes. It's funny how I based a character's importance to the show by the amount of fight scenes that they were in. My world wavered. There was something. In my head. Something I couldn't quite place, except that it told me that where I was, was wrong. What I was thinking was wrong. Whom I loved was wrong. What is your name? The question took me by surprise and I hesitated. I knew my name. Of course I did, didn't I? I mean, how could I not? But the name I possessed wasn't the name that the voice wanted. What is your name? Chelsea, I offered to the voice. My name is Chelsea. What is your name? I didn't know. I had no idea. What? Is. Your. Name? I don't know, I prayed to the voice. I don't know what name you're asking for. Hey Chelsea, Shane said as he appeared in the living room doorway. Have you seen Kurinai? What did you just say? I said, have you seen my car keys? Oh. I hope you see Sakumo again. What? He frowned. I said, I hope they're not in my sock drawer again. Hey, are you feeling okay? No. No, I wasn't. Sakumo as in Sakumo Haddock. Kakashi's dad. Everything flickered again and then winked out. Voices flooded my senses my hearing, sight and taste. It was an impossible reaction to sound, but I felt it. More and more voices joined the cacophony in my head. Gray, Kagura-san. This is my son, Kakashi. Kakashi, this Kurei and Kagura-san, and their daughters Kurinai-san and Ayaka Haim. Hi, I'm Ayaka. Sakumo-sama has told me so much about you, Kakashi-kun. What's your name? Ayaka Iki. I like you. Hi. My name is Ayaka. The images' memories were flooding in now, cramming their way into my brain, burning, stretching, reminding how could I have forgotten my own name. I knew now. I knew who I was. And this this world. Wasn't real this world didn't belong to me. I wasn't a part of it. At least, not anymore. Perhaps I had been once. Once, when I was still Chelsea, but I was not her anymore. Her time had come and gone, and it was time for someone new to take center stage. Chelsea. What's wrong? Shane knelt before me, his hand stretching to land on my back. I recoiled and pulled away. Chelsea, calm down. Are you sick? He sounded panicked, but it wasn't real. This isn't real. What do you mean? Shane asked. What are you trying to say? You're not real. Chelsea. I'm right here. Of course I'm real. No. You're not. I said, scuttling further away as Shane began to shuffle closer. None of this is real. This is all just made up. No. 
No, it's not. He sounded pained now. He kept moving forward, as if desperate to touch me to reassure me. To convince me to stay. But this wasn't home. It was just some far some illusion conjured up to distract me. Distract me from what? Delcy, please, he choked. I'll let you keep your DVDs. I'll do anything. Just don't go anywhere. I need to go home. No. You don't. That's not your home. Your home is here with me. You're safer here with me. Shane almost shouted at me. You don't understand. You don't want to go back you shouldn't want to go back. Trust me. You trust me, don't you? I don't know you. Chelsea had known him, I didn't. He gaped at me for a second, but recovered quickly. But I know you, Chelsea, and my name isn't Chelsea. The walls began to spin around us, and from seemingly nowhere a familiar middle-aged couple were suddenly standing over Shane's shoulder, looking down at me. Don't leave us, my darling, the woman said, her light-colored hair pulled up into a severe bun and the eyes behind her glass swimming. The middle-aged man on her arm had crow's feet around his eyes, and the edges of his dark hair was beginning to gray. Mum dad I breathed. Live, seashell, dad no, the man said, looking at me sadly. Live with us. Live for your future. Don't leave. Don't make us go on without you. Be but, I choked, nearly crying out. You're not real. Of course, we're real, the woman soothed softly. Chelsea, my name isn't Chelsea. I practically screamed. I wanted them to go away. I didn't belong here. They didn't belong here. Shane stared at me for a moment, blinking fast. He made a move to touch me again, but his hand fell short. Then what is your name? What is your name? What is your name? Chelsea's parents intoned together at the same moment. Their monotony was almost scary. What is your name? I took a deep breath, centering myself. My mind cleared and the name came to me almost like a nerve reflex involuntarily and uncontrollable. The name burst from my lips. Aoka Iki my name is Aoka Iki. And I want to go home. I felt a light tingling sensation all over my body as I changed. My hair darkened, the planes of my face rearranged, my eyes changed colors, my whole body shortened and thinned to that of a five-year-old girl. Delcy's parents gave me a horrified look, but it was Shane who made a desperate grab for me. No. Wait you don't want to go back. Trust me. There's danger. The world around us shuddered, flickering and trembling. And then everything began to fold in upon itself, as if it were made of paper. Chelsea's parents. The walls. The DVD collection and TV. And then Shane himself. All of it disappearing into itself until there was nothing left except darkness. Even the floor below me had disappeared. I was sitting floating, perhaps. In darkness, unable to determine if I were facing up or down, spinning or still, rising or falling. And through it all, Shane's words echoed back to me. There's danger, what could he possibly mean by that? I awoke slowly and pleasantly, stretching the kinks and knots from my shoulders and arms as I yawned widely. It had been a good sleep. A very good sleep. I must have slept like a log and slept right through any attempts mama could have made to rouse me. That dream though, I stretched again. My mattress was so, so soft. I could almost imagine drifting off again, but no. I had to get up. I had to get to the academy and my classes. Papa would get mad if he thought I was ditching my training to just lay around in bed all day. Yeah, he definitely wouldn't be pleased. But my eyes were so heavy. I tried to force them open, but they only just quickly sealed closed again. I must have been really tired last night. Blindly, I reached out for the bottle of water I kept on my bedside table. My mouth was so dry, it felt like it was stuffed with cotton. At first I touched nothing, then the back of my hand knocked over something hard and it hit the ground with a startling crash. That woke me up. I started forward in bed, heart hammering and my eyes snapping open. This this wasn't my bedroom. Actually, this wasn't even a room in my house, it almost looked like a hospital room. I looked down to the floor. Shards of glass and flowers littered the floor. It had obviously been a vase in its past life. Not anymore. Past life, my dream it had been so strange. So very vivid and foreboding. And those people I had known them. They were people who had been important to me. I tried to recall their names their faces, but the dream was slipping away the more I tried to grasp at it. I remembered the events the warning that I was in danger, but who exactly were these people? I had known them while I was in the dream, but then again, no one really questions anything when they're dreaming. Except me. I had known that it wasn't real. My head was starting to hurt. Ayaka. I glanced up, seeing Mama and Papa rush into the room, followed by a haggard nurse. But something was off with them. I could see that they were my parents, but I could see something else too. It seemed familiar. It took me only a short moment to understand that it was not what I was seeing it was what I was feeling. That warmth. The sparking threads. They weren't precisely visible, but I could sense them. Somehow. Just like I had with Kurinai. Ayaka. Thank goodness, you're awake. Mama cried, darting around to the side of the bed that didn't have glass all over the floor and hugging me tight to her chest. 
I allowed myself to be swallowed by her arms and pushed my face into her chest. It felt nice to be held like this. I looked up. Papa was watching me from the foot of the hospital bed. He looked tired, but I could see the small smile of relief on his face that made me feel guilty that I had worried them. Wait where was Kurunai? Otu-san. Ka-san. I mumbled. My throat was so dry it was hard to get any sound out. I licked my lips and tried again. Otu-san, Ka-san, W-Y-M-I, I managed to choke out before I began a coughing fit. Mama pushed a cup of water into my hands and I drained it without thought, holding it out for more. I watched a nurse sweep up the shards of glass and broken flowers with a broom as Mama filled the cup again from the jug of water on a table nearby. We were silent as I drained two more cups of water and the nurse left the room, having swept all the debris into a dustpan before anyone spoke. Ayaka, Papa pressed gently. Do you remember what happened? What had happened? Yes, I said, glad to feel that the words were coming out a lot easier now. We we were sparring. You were there. I glanced up at Papa. He seemed to be waiting for me to continue. And then something happened. My head was hurting. And then what was hurting my head started to hurt Kurunai. Silence fell over the room once again. I sat there, in the bed, watching Mama and Papa as they looked at me for what felt like an eternity before I felt the overwhelming need to fill the void between us. Otu-san. Is Kurunai okay? Where is she? I could feel my lips trembling as the questions tumbled out of them. I had to know. I blinked quickly in a vain attempt to keep the tears at bay. Papa smiled. Yes, she's fine. Don't worry about her. She's awake and talking. I breathed a sigh of relief. You slept through the whole night and most of today. Huh? I couldn't help but gape. How long had I been unconscious? Mama laughed. You've been asleep for nearly 24 hours. It's almost 4 in the afternoon. You were very chakra exhausted and then you got a fever during the night and you were speaking nonsense. Your father and I had couldn't make sense of what you were saying. A fever? But I felt fine. Oh. The dream. It must have been a fever dream, that would make sense. But still I wasn't convinced. And sheesh, it was already 4 in the afternoon. I was so not going to get to sleep tonight. Do you know what happened yesterday? What made me use all of my chakra? Is it my fault? Did I do something wrong? I rushed out, suddenly remembering my utterly useless and feeble attempts to stop the hands from grabbing at Kurunai. Perhaps everyone encountered these hands upon using chakra and just hadn't told me about it, unlikely. I shuddered. I didn't want to have to think about them. I just wanted to shove them far, far away in the back of my head and forget that they had ever emerged. But it just wasn't that easy. I had to confront this. To make sure that this would never happen again. I had heard stories Mama would tell them to me at bedtime of shinobi with too strong a skill accidentally hurting those around them, as well as spurned individuals who made desperate deals for power that always came back to haunt them. I had to understand what was happening to me. Maybe then I could stop it from happening again. Mama and Papa shared a look before Mama jumped to answer me. Of course it wasn't your fault, honey. It was just a freak accident. But their hesitation had been answer enough. What happened to her to Kurunai? Really. Papa sighed, running a hand through his hair. She was put under a very strong jinjutsu, we think. You think? Yes, that's what we believe. But you don't know for sure. No. Okay. I looked down, clasping my hands together in my lap. Was I did I do that? Was I the one who made that jinjutsu? It didn't feel like a jinjutsu. Mama and Papa shared another look with each other, communicating silently. After a while, they seemed to come to some kind of an agreement as they both turned back to face me without a word being uttered. Yes. That's what your father and I think. Mama said, taking my hand and squeezing it gently. But it didn't feel like a jinjutsu, I reiterated, as if it were a valid excuse for what I had caused. It felt like something else entirely. Mama's shoulders sagged in defeat at my admission, and Papa's face twisted into a stern frown. I realized something at that moment. You know something about this. They didn't answer, only continued to look at me. You have to tell me what's happening to me, I begged. I need to learn to control it so that it won't happen again and, enough. Papa interrupted sharply. Grey Mama said gently, turning to face her husband. I think it might be a good idea to tell her. Papa frowned at her for a moment before he turned back to face me. He seemed to consider his next words carefully before he spoke them. Ayaka. Your mother and I have something very important that we need to tell you. He stopped speaking, looking suddenly conflicted. If he says that I'm adopted, I am going to flip out. We think that you may have an ability from your mother's side of the family Papa said slowly, treading carefully. My mother's side of the family okay, so I'm not adopted. Good. What ability? I looked at Mama, but her eyes were downcast as if she were ashamed. Or scared. Perhaps this was one of the reasons why we didn't speak about her side of the family. Her and I had already told me that she had managed to figure out that Mama was born to a shinobi clan, but not which clan obviously not one of the larger ones. Hasan? I asked quietly. 
You were born to a shinobi clan, weren't you? What is Otu-san talking about? What ability? Mama said nothing, just shook her head noncommittally. Yes, your mother was born to a shinobi clan. We don't talk about them because they didn't approve of your mother's choices. As in, Mama married whom she wanted to. This clan was once great and widely feared due to the ability they wielded the Kekai Genkai they possessed, but in recent times the number of clansmen born with the Kekai Genkai has fallen to one every generation if they're lucky. So was Papa telling me that he thought that I had a Kekai Genkai. Received from a family that I didn't know. I tried to think of all the clans I knew of that possessed Kekai Genkai. The Haikta, I was definitely not one of them, the Achiha, possibly, though Mama didn't look like any of the Achiha that I had ever seen, the Senju, that wouldn't make any sense, their Kekai Genkai was the wood style, not mental hands that could enter other people's minds. What other clans in Kanoha could there be? I couldn't think of any. The Yamanakas, Naras and Akamichis were all prominent clans, but their abilities were due to keeping their technique secret, rather than being due to an actual innate ability. Yeah, I was out of ideas. So you think that I have this Kekai Genkai? I asked, my stomach sinking. I had overheard Papa telling Mama about the massacres of people with Kekai Genkai in Kurigakur, the hidden mist village, whether they were loyal shinobi or innocent children. Yes, Mama answered, meeting my eyes for the first time. Usually it isn't bad, but when it culminates unexpectedly she left the sentence go unfinished. But what did this Kekai Genkai actually do? I thought back to what I had felt during the spar yesterday and found that the memories came back surprisingly easily for me. The hands made of chakra scratching around inside my head were a little too hard to forget. I shuddered. I had stepped toward Kurinai and pressed my fingers to her forehead, and my chakra had surged forward into her mind. Much like a jinjutsu. Except that I hadn't needed to concentrate. I hadn't directed my chakra to do that I wasn't sure if I was even at that level of control where I could pull off a jinjutsu that could incapacitate someone for a few hours. And the sheer amount of chakra that would have been needed too well, no wonder I had fainted from exhaustion. Appa must have been following my line of thought because he confirmed my suspicions. It's a proficiency with Jinjutsu and an influence over the human mind so great that you can literally kill with Jinjutsu alone. I blinked in surprise. B, but that's impossible. I squawked, gawking at both my parents. Jinjutsu are just illusions. How can you kill someone with only using illusions? Appa looked to Mama for an explanation. My clan has dwindled considerably since the days before the founding of Kanoha, she began, looking as if she had swallowed something sour. The Kekai Genkai of my family has diluted throughout that time too, to the point where everyone has an above aptitude for Jinjutsu myself included, but do not inherit the Kekai Genkai in its entirety. But sometimes a member of the clan is born with the full Kekai Genkai, not the diluted one that the rest of us have. This ability the Yasasakai makes it possible to kill a person through Jinjutsu because it takes complete control over key parts of the brain, such as the medulla oblongata, which is key in controlling involuntary functions such as heartbeat, blood pressure and breathing. The Yasasakai allows an individual to control these things within the body, essentially making it possible to persuade the body into having a heart attack or to stop breathing altogether. That's what makes it possible to kill someone using Jinjutsu. Are you following, Ayaka? I nodded. It was just a lot to take in. That I would be able to do this. The prospect that I would be able to get inside a person's head and persuade their body to just die made me feel a little nauseous. So if I were to cast a Jinjutsu of a blizzard, then... It's a little more complicated than that, but yes, your victim could die of hypothermia. But it's very difficult to just kill someone using Jinjutsu. You have to have access parts of the brain that other Jinjutsu users would never dream of being able to reach. Mama stated. It was a relief to hear her say that I wouldn't just be able to think someone to death, that just maybe I wouldn't accidentally kill my loved ones with a stray thought or ill-tempered emotion. But something still didn't sit right with me memories of my past life had re-emerged after the strange dream I'd had. I could remember things about this world that I could only remember knowing when I was an infant. It was an alienating feeling, the concept that I was remembering aspects of my past life that pertained to my future. But I remembered. Not everything, but enough to make sense of what was happening. And what was going to happen. Sakumo I remembered how his storyline was going to end and how it affected Kakashi. They didn't deserve what was going to happen to them. It wasn't fair. But maybe I could make a difference. Tsukumo was rumored to have been at least as strong if not stronger than the San in themselves, I would be doing Kanoha a great disservice if I left Tsukumo to his fate. It's a lot to take in, I know. Mama said gently, bringing me from my reverie. They truly had no idea. Ayaka, Papa said sternly, moving to stand beside me, so I had to crane my neck to look at him. You can't tell anyone about this, do you understand me? Yes. I nodded, feeling a little intimidated by his intensity. I knew for the obvious reasons not to tell anyone that I had a Kekai Genkai that would turn me into a killing machine. 
I wasn't scared so much of Kuridaku's persecution, rather than the prospect of more immediate dangers like Ruta Rajimaru, finding out that a girl from a small shinobi family with no considerable connections had the ability to persuade people to just drop dead. And while I could easily see it as being used as a force for good, I could just as easily see it being abused and myself being coerced or tortured into using it to hurt innocents. Man, my imagination was going overboard today. A sudden thought struck me. Wait what about Kurinai? Does she have the Yuso's thing the ability? No, Papa replied. It's possible that she inherited the aptitude for Jinjutsu aspect from your mother's family, but other than that no. But don't worry we'll have you back to your old self in no time. My old self? What do you mean, Otu-san? I asked. Don't worry about it too much, Ayaka. The Hokage has decided and we agreed to get a few Injutsu specialists in to seal away the Isasakai so that this won't happen again. Papa informed me. I was stunned. He was just going to lock it away. Shouldn't this ability be nurtured? It would definitely give me an edge above everybody else friends and enemies alike. It just didn't make sense to seal away an ability my ability that had so much potential, and I told Papa as such. Like I said, Ayaka. We don't want a repeat of what happened yesterday during the spar. You don't want something like that to happen again, do you? I felt immediately chastened, my ire dissipating. He was right. It wouldn't be worth keeping if it were only just going to explode in my family's faces and mine. Perhaps, Papa continued. One day you may come to the stage where you are ready to learn how to use it, or the seal weakens so gradually that you acclimatize to it slowly, but that day is not today. I had to see her, I thought, walking down the hospital corridor towards Kurinai's room. The same haggard nurse who had cleaned up the vase I had broken had come in earlier to usher my parents out of the room, clucking something about keeping me in the hospital overnight for observation. Not much later, I had jumped out of bed and bugged an intern into telling me where my sister's room was. Room 39, room 40, room ah. Room 42. The room Kurinai was in. I stepped inside, closing the door softly behind me. The curtain was closed around the only occupied bed in the room, and I made my way quietly towards it. There was a soft glow from a lamp coming from behind the curtain that dimly lit the dark room, so I knew that there was a good chance that she was awake. I took a deep breath and clasped my trembling hands together, afraid that she might be changing or sleeping, and I she might get angry with me for disturbing her. I could only hope that she didn't hate me for putting her in the hospital to begin with. I took a quick peek around the curtain and let out the deep breath that I hadn't even been aware that I had been holding. Gurin I was sitting up in her hospital bed, reading by the lamp on her bedside table. She looked up as I entered her space, smiling politely. Nisan. I'm so glad you're okay. I raced forward and hugged her, fighting hard to hold back the tears. I felt immediately that something was very wrong. Kurinai had gone very stiff all of a sudden, and she wasn't hugging back she always hugged back. I pulled back, seeing her face looking at me with bemused surprise. Oni san I'm sorry do I know you? She asked confusedly, blinking fast and putting down her book. Huh? I am I stopped, thrown by her question, I couldn't recollect myself. I took a deep breath. I'm Ayaka, silly. Upon her blank look, I added. Your sister. Her and I looked puzzled. I don't have a sister. We stared at each other for a long time, each of us trying to discern if the other was playing some kind sick joke. It wasn't funny. I don't have a sister. What do you mean? I'm standing right here. I said. Then I had an idea, a kernel of hope that made my heart lift. Are you angry with me? I'm so sorry, I didn't know what was happening. So mad that you're pretending that I don't exist I thought, holding her gaze. Please let that be the reason. Please let it be something I can fix. Please, 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 please. I was the first to turn away, staring out into the dim daylight that had managed to filter through the overcast sky weakly. There was not a spot of blue in the sky to be seen, and the clouds stretching to the horizon were roiling in upon themselves, blotting into an inky gray. It was only a matter of time before it would rain. Kurinai's brow furrowed as she looked at me, the confusion clear on her face. Not even Kurinai could fake that look of genuine bewilderment. I felt my heart sink to the pit of my stomach like a heavy weight. She truly didn't know who I was. I thought to back that moment of euphoric pain yesterday when the hands had dived into her brain, remembering the way they had plucked and rearranged the strings in her head. They had rewired her brain from the inside. I had never heard of any Jinjutsu doing that before. Omen, Nisan, Kurinai said, shifting uncomfortably on her mattress. I think you have mistaken me for someone else. No. No, no 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 no. This couldn't be happening. How could this be happening? Mama and Papa had said that she was fine. They had lied. Why would they lie to me? They keep you away from Kurinai. But why? They don't want you to hurt her again. It had been an accident. I hadn't meant to. It wasn't my fault. Mama and Papa had said so. Didn't you just call them liars? Kurinai shifted on her bed again, drawing my gaze back to her. What on earth had just happened? How had my life come to this? 
I rubbed at my eyes harshly with the back of my hand in an attempt to banish the prickling in my eyes. I wasn't even supposed to be here. Not in this room, this situation, this life. I am sorry. My mistake. I managed to croak out, spinning on my heel and fleeing the room before she could say something to stop me. Which she didn't. I raced down corridors and around corners, dodging past patients and medical personnel alike. It didn't matter where I ended up, I couldn't handle the magnitude of what had happened. The magnitude of what I had done to Kurinai. What had I done to Kurinai? Realistically, I couldn't have been running for more than a few minutes, but what felt like a long time, each step making me feel older than I should feel. My foot suddenly slipped out from under me, and I was sent tumbling across the floor, coming to a halt on my back, staring up at the ceiling. I really needed to work on breaking my foals rather than my butt and back. Staring up at the ceiling, I tried to think of other things that would usually bother me, like, missing out on a day of academy classes, or what the hospital staff thought of a five-year-old girl sprinting through the hospital like a bat out of hell. But it didn't work. My thoughts kept being drawn back to that horrible moment when I had damaged a part of my sister that I wasn't sure would ever return. Why are you on the floor? I sat up quickly, my heart pounding and my face flushing. I hadn't heard anybody approach. The blonde-haired woman in her mid-thirties wearing a white lab coat and holding a clipboard stood over me, her expression stern and disapproving. She looked familiar, but I couldn't place her face, perhaps she was one of the medics I had run into in my flight from Kurinai's room. I swallowed audibly. I hope not, for my sake. Well? Are you going to answer? Or am I going to have to bludgeon the answer out of you? She snapped, lifting her clipboard threateningly. I scurried backwards until my back was pressed against the wall, breathing heavily. There was a familiar tickling sensation at the back of my head, like an itch that just could not be scratched. A sudden fear clutched at my heart. It was happening again, wasn't it? The hands were back, taunting me with their presence at the back of my mind. The itching sensation began to spread. Crying out, I grasped my head in between my hands, scratching at my scalp furiously. I knew what to expect after the last time it had happened, and I thought that if it ever happened again I would be able to handle it better. But there was just so much pain that I couldn't even see straight. It felt tiny bugs were crawling just under the skin of my scalp as the hands uncoiled within my head, awakening like a pit of snakes. They dragged themselves forward by anchoring their fingernails in my brain, each anchor feeling like a tiny knife being stabbed into my head. They were going to hurt someone again, and I could feel their bloodlust as they sought an escape from my head to claw at the mind of the blonde woman in front of me. To render and dismantle. Just like they had done to Kurinai. My itching intensified as the hand slid faster and faster towards my eyes, my finger becoming slippery and graceless in my ineffectual scratching. Kurinai, no. I wouldn't let it happen again. I had to beat this thing for Kurinai. I clenched my eyes closed and clapped my hands over both my ears, just as the hands crawled into my eyes. I could feel them behind my eyelids, more and more of them trying to pry open my eyes. My body began to shake with the sheer effort of keeping them contained within myself. I wanted to just give up. Maybe if I gave up the pain would go away. Think of Kurinai. The pressure behind my eyelids grew to painful proportions, and I was afraid that my eyes would explode when it continued to grow further. I could tell now that there weren't as many hands now as there had been the first time they'd made themselves known in my head far less. How could I possibly hope to manage this ability when I could barely contain a fraction of the power I'd wielded before? For Kurinai. I had to keep them back but I couldn't. I wanted to be in control but I wasn't strong enough. I didn't want to give up but I was afraid. Kurinai, my eyes opened. The hands froze. I stared at the blonde medic in front of me, her fingers pressed against my forehead and pushing a steady flow of chakra into my head. The hands flailed ineffectually and tried to find purchase to continue their onward track, but the blonde woman's chakra kept pushing them back, back, back. To the back of my mind the hands retreated, then further, down my brainstem until I couldn't feel them anymore, and the pain in my head stopped abruptly. Wide-eyed, I stared at her. How had she downed that? It takes someone of exceptional chakra control to push one's chakra into another's mind, a large reason why Jinjutsu experts were so rare. You, the blonde woman began, straightening to her feet, have some explaining to do. I remained silent as she steered me back towards my room, content to count the number of tiles we walked over, rather than focus on anything else. It seemed to only take a minute for the blonde woman to lead me back inside my room. The door closed behind us, and she gently shoved me towards the bed. I sat down on the edge of the mattress, my hands shaking. I had lost control. Again. Just like I had with Kurinai. This could have been Kurinai all over again. I had tried to hold back the flood of hands I had even managed to hold them off for a precious few seconds, but I couldn't find any particular part of that as a cause for celebration. If it hadn't been of this particular woman who had found me if it had been anyone else, they would have ended up like Kurinai. Or worse. That's why I couldn't feel even a tiny bit pleased that I had had the will to fend them off. 
the amount of hands that had been present just moments ago was just a drop in the bucket compared to the sheer number that had risen during their attack on Kurinai. If I couldn't even hold a droplet off for more than a minute, how was it ever going to be possible for me to control this ability this Kekai Genkai in its entirety? You don't. You should lie down, the blonde medic said, moving to the foot of my bed to review my charts. I gazed idly down at my feet, wriggling my toes, but remained silent. The blonde woman glanced up from the clipboard, eyes narrowing. What are you, deaf? Explain, brat. I swallowed noisily and scratched at my forehead, but kept my gaze downcast. I heard her sigh and moved towards me. She sat down on the mattress beside me. We stayed like that for a while, each of us in our own respective thoughts imagining, pondering, praying for a future that would turn out better than our pasts. It was exactly a companionable silence, but it was comfortable enough that I didn't mind. You I began after a period of time. You're Tsunade, aren't you? One of the Sanin and granddaughter of the Shaddai Hokage. And the future Godim Hokage. Though it was phrased like a question, I spoke it as though it were already a matter of fact. Because I knew it was she. I still remembered her from the Naruto and I I used to watch when I was alive the first time. I couldn't remember everything about that time, but I remembered this I remembered her. She looked at me in surprise, though I suspect that it was due to the fact that I had spoken rather than because I had known who she was. She was the Shaddai's granddaughter, after all. Everyone knew of Tsunade Haim and her gambling habits. One quality the village boasted about, the other not so much. That's correct, she replied. And you're the Iki brat. Yes. Ayaka. I introduced myself. Silence reigned once again. The mark will stay for a while until the Hokage organizes for a better seal to be placed upon you. Tsunade said, reaching out and pulling my hand away from my forehead. I hadn't noticed that I had still been scratching my forehead. You put a seal on me? I asked, reaching up with my other hand to rub the tingling skin of my forehead. Yes, your chakra was out of control. The seal isn't perfect, but it'll do until a seal master can come up with a suitable alternative. What was that chakra? I couldn't say it couldn't admit to my family's ability. I should tell her everything, I knew that, but I didn't want to. That it's the reason I hurt my sister, I muttered, gaze dropping to the floor once more. I didn't mean to but I had no choice. Just like I nearly hurt you. You had no control, she surmised. I shrugged. I guess. But it didn't feel like normal chakra. It was strange and scary. It just appeared and I couldn't hold it back, soon aid shifted closer. Perhaps the reason why it doesn't feel like chakra is because it isn't. She inquired. I noticed it was pulling from your regular chakra reserves earlier, but it wouldn't be correct to say that what was happening was a jutsu, then what could it be? An ability of some sort, most likely. Possibly Kekai Genkai. I sighed bitterly and looked down at my feet. That's what Mama and Papa think. I admitted, sullen. And what do you think? Tsunade asked. I ah no I don't know what to think, except that it scares me. A realization struck me. And and I want to control it. My head shot up as Tsunade laughed, placing a hand on my head and mussing my hair. You're alright, for a brat. She laughed, straightening to her feet. But maybe you'd be better off without it, seeing as what happened to your sister. She was right, of course. A shinobi who had no control over their abilities wasn't just a liability on the battlefield, but a very real threat to the village too. And Kurinai Kurinai had been hurt by it. It may have been an accident, but it had still happened. And it had nearly happened to Tsunade too, the most skilled medic nin in the five nations. The greatest medic nin, something very obvious just occurred to me. Tsunade Sama. Um, my sister could you take a look at her? Fix her? I tried to keep the hope out of my voice, I really did. But by her sudden pained expression I knew that I had been pitifully transparent. Your sister? Yes. The blonde-haired San and sighed and looked distinctly uncomfortable. I've already checked on your sister. I was there when she woke up. Physically, your sister is fine, there were no contusions, concussions or cerebral swelling. There wasn't any indication that there was anything wrong with your sister at all until she woke up and your parents realized that she could remember everything except you. Except me. I thought, feeling my stomach twist bitterly. She remembers everything except me. I suppose I should have known, but I was only a hairbreadth away from having a complete and total mental breakdown. I felt like I had aged 20 years in the last 24 hours well, on top of the other years I had from before. I could see the questions in Tsunade's eyes, that scientific curiosity seemingly innate to all scientists, no matter what world you lived in. That inner fire for discovery. She wanted to ask how I had managed to erase all aspects of my existence from my sister so cleanly, so precisely, without even meaning to. I'm certain that if it were her choice, if she were calling the shots, she would have had me studied and try to ascertain the basis of this ability and how it could be controlled. It's what Chelsea would have done. But the estimated risk of me causing more damage than the ability was worth was just too high. To someone like her, though, I wasn't a worry. To anyone above Chknin, I was probably not a threat. 
but to my fellow classmates and untrained civilians, I had the potential to cause immeasurable damage. That's why it would be necessary to seal it away. But it didn't change the complete desolation I was feeling like I was completely alone in this new world. My mother and father could forget me just as easily as Kur and I had. What would I do if I lost them? Who would I be if I lost them? I'm sorry, Ayaka-chan. There is nothing I can do for her now. I'm sure the Amanakas and some of the censor nins will look into it, but I can't promise you anything. Tsunade said, crouching down to look me in the eyes. Perhaps I didn't want her pity nor her empty promises. It wasn't what I deserved. I deserved hatred not kindness. I wanted to feel hurt blamed. I blamed myself, so why couldn't she? I wanted every part of me the hands in my head included to know that what had happened to Kur and I was not okay. That I was not wicked through and through. That, deep down, I was a good person. I didn't want her understanding. Don't you have lives to save or something? I said, more sharply than I intended. Or do you get paid to waste your patient's time? Tsunade's back stiffened at my rudeness. She shot me a stern, disapproving look before she strode out of the room without another word. And I was alone. It was the way they looked at me now. I hadn't noticed it earlier that afternoon when I had woken up in that hospital bed, but I noticed it now. It was awkward. Our relationship had never been strained or awkward before, not to this degree. They would glance at me, but then look away quickly, as if afraid to hold my gaze. Almost like they were afraid of me. It frightened me. I frightened me. My parents, they had woken me up in my hospital room in the middle of the night, giving me a bundle of clothes to get changed into, and urging me to be fast and quiet. They hadn't offered me an explanation for barging into my room at such a late hour, nor had they apologized. And it had only taken me a silent, confused moment while getting changed to piece it together. I must be going to see the hokage to get the hand sealed away. I suppose it would explain why both Mama and Papa were so keen to get me out the door. What confused me was the secrecy. Why bother doing this in the middle of the night? The Hokage's office in the administrative division of the academy was protected night and day, it would be impossible for anyone to listen in to any conversations within those walls. This was supposed to be a simple ceiling, not a secret S-rank mission that required stealth under the cover of darkness within my own village. A sense that my own village might not be as safe as I thought scared me a little. My parents teared me out of the hospital towards the academy, and the Hokage's office looks like my assumption was right. I thought I would have had to wait longer for a Kenjutsu master to be available to seal away the hands a few days at least. I wonder if we're being tailed by Anbu the thought sent a shiver up my spine, and I glanced around warily, catching Mama's attention. What's the matter, Ayaka? She questioned quietly, stooping slightly so that I could hear her. Papa turned marginally from where he was marching on ahead of us, setting the route to the Hokage's office. They were both watching me intently studying me looking for any indication that I might go crazy and start messing with their minds. Their distrust and wariness wounded me in a way that I had never expected possible. But I couldn't blame them. I looked to the ground and kept walking, shaking my head. Nothing, I muttered. Papa spared me another glance before turning his back to us. To me. I tried not to take it personally, but I did. Because it hurt. Suck it up, Ayaka. An unwelcome voice in my head said. Shit happens. Put on your big girl panties and soldier on. Sighing through my nose, we continued on without any further interruptions. Well, not quite. Walking around in a shinobi village especially at night isn't all fun and games. There are always ninja silhouettes flitting from shadow to shadow in the streets and jumping from rooftop to rooftop during the night. It was frightening for civilians to roam the streets at night. Safe but frightening. We were almost stopped twice before reaching the academy, but Papa would usher Mama and I into a convenient alleyway and hide us or otherwise place a jinjutsu on the shinobi so his eyes would just skim right over us. The amount of effort we had to put into hiding our presence was making me anxious it was definitely over the top. The large round moon sat heavy and bright in the sky, casting long shadows that seemed to creep closer and closer towards my feet with every passing glance I made. In truth, the moon was full, and I remembered the silhouette of a certain shinobi crouched on a spire in front of it, dressed in an Anbu uniform after just killing his entire clan. Itachi Achiha. I knew from my rough estimation of where I was born into the timeline that the Ichiha massacre would not happen for many more years into the future, but perhaps with careful planning and preparation, I could could what? Prevent the massacre. Let the Ichiha mutiny take place. Save Itachi the heartache and kill the Ichiha clan off myself. What a joke. I bit back another sigh before it left my lips and looked up. We were at the academy or rather, the administrative division based within the academy building. I had never entered through this entrance before I had never had any reason to. The academy students entered from the other side of the building, and, although it was one building, there was very little interaction between the two departments. There could be no avoiding the people within the building, with there being only one entrance and no shadows or alleyways to hide down in the brightly lit corridors of the building. 
Papa strode purposefully through the lobby of the building towards the stairs, Mama ushering me along quietly. As could be expected, there weren't many people still here at this late an hour, but there were still some. They didn't spare us a second glance as they went about their particular jobs and activities. The Hokage's office was situated on the top floor of the academy building, and there were two things I noticed as we rounded the last corner and the office door came into view. Tsukumo and Kakashi. They were standing outside the door to the office and I almost stopped short in surprise, but Mama's gentle but firm hand on my shoulder pushed me onwards. Not sure of how else to greet them, I waved. Tsukumo's eyes crinkled and his lips lifted into that smile I was so very fond of, raising a hand and giving me a short wave back. In compliment to this, Kakashi didn't bat an eyelid, but rather observed me coolly. He really was acting like such an ingrate which was a shame because he'd been one of my favorite characters in the anime. Oh well. There's still time. Maybe. Tsukumo-san, Mama greeted, moving forward and falling into step with Papa. What are you doing here? It was a little late to be making an overt and honest audience with the Hokage, and, even if that were the case, such clandestine meetings wouldn't be organized so close in time together where we would see them leaving. So why on earth were they here? Did you have a meeting with the Hokage? Papa frowned, no doubt following my line of thought to a tea Papa glanced at his watch. You must have gone over time because we're here right on time for our appointment. Which more or less translated from ninja speak to. Don't speak of our late night visit and we won't speak of yours. Gray, Kagura-san, Ayaka-chan. He greeted pleasantly, seemingly at ease with the tense expressions of my parents. The Hokage actually invited us to be present for the meeting, no idea why. We were just waiting outside for you to show up. He was straight to the point, trying to set my parents' anxieties at ease. I appreciated it. Actually, it felt good to see him, to know that he was alive and well. Even though my own parents were becoming wary of me, Sakumo just seemed to want to treat me the same as he always had. I didn't want that to change. I cared for him a lot. And although this admission was true, I still surprised myself by dashing past my parents and blumping him. There was a stunned silence for a moment before I felt his warm hand press against the top of my head in a gesture of affection. Blushing, I stepped back quickly, quickly glancing at Kakashi. He was definitely treating me the same, staring at me with dull disinterest. Some things just never change, I guess. Tsukumo sama, Kakashi kun. I said, by way of greeting. It's good to see you both again. Likewise, Kakashi replied flatly. I stared at him. His rudeness was contemptible, and I wanted nothing more than to smack him in the face. He was arrogant and proud, and his manners were appalling. And and he was staring back at me. Last time he barely had the nerve to look me in the eye and had spent most of his time staring at his feet. But this time was different. He stared at me, and I stared back. Did he ever take off his mask? And would it kill him to push a quick brush through his hair? Maybe learn how to talk and associate with society in general? I couldn't comprehend why he was being such a dick. Damn it, why was he even here? I didn't need him here. I didn't want him here. Me, me, me. It's all you ever think about, isn't it? This was larger than me. Sure, this meeting with the Hokage was certain to be about the hands, but that didn't mean that I was the only person involved in this mess. I could have an impact on the larger community the public. How would it look to other villages if a five-year-old girl began killing or injuring her fellow citizens? The Sandane was known for being wise and benevolent, but not even he would be able to stop the execution order that would undoubtedly come down from the elders. Weirdly enough, I didn't feel scared by that. Following an odd impulse, I stuck out my tongue at him with an eye. And stomped past him. I faintly heard Sukumo and Papa's amused chuckles and Mama's gasp of incredulity at my manners, or lack thereof. Obviously Kakashi was rubbing off on me. Ugh. Gross. We entered the Hokages in a cluster of arms and legs. Or rather, Kakashi and I did. Kakashi had tried to enter the Hokages' office first, and I, being in a bad mood, had made to beat him through the door. What ensued was the aforementioned tangle of limbs and the uttering of profanities that I'm not proud of knowing the meaning of, shortly before I landed on flat on my face before the Hokages' desk. I really did know how to make an entrance. Hello there, an older man with a graying goatee said pleasantly, sitting at the Hokages' desk. You must be Aaka. He seemed mildly amused by me. The Hokage. I scrambled to my feet, my face flushing. God, I was such an idiot, racing into the room like a brat. I risked a glance at Kakashi, but found him as unruffled as a rock. The bastard. Yes, Hokage-sama, Papa said. I felt his hands fall on both my shoulders behind me. This is my daughter. The Sandame surprised me with a kind smile. It's very nice to meet you, Ayaka may I call you Ayaka. You know who I am, don't you? Every man and his dog in Kanahagakur know who you are, old man. Yes, of course. And you are the Lord Hokage, Hokage-sama. The third Hokage smiled again briefly before his eyes shifted to something at the side of the room. I followed his gaze. 
I jumped, muffling a squawk with my hands. Sunade and Jureus stood to the side of the room, observing. I'm aware that you have already met Sunade, but the man beside her is Jurea. Jurea stepped forward, grinning. Nice to meet you, kid. I hear you've been raising all kinds of Helga. He was interrupted by a sharp jab to the ribs from Tsunade. Clasping my hands together nervously, I bowed. It's nice to meet you, I greeted Jureya. I'm sorry for my rudeness to you earlier, Tsunade Sama. I was out of line. It was probably in my best interests to make amends with the future Godim Hokage. It's fine, Tsunade said, and I'm certain I heard her mutter Brad under her breath. Lord Hokage, with all due respect, why are we here? Sakumo spoke up. Haddock is correct, we'd best move straight to point, the third Hokage began. As I'm sure you can guess the reason why you're all here is because of this little lady in front of us. I flushed again under his gaze as he turned toward me, but steeled myself not to look away. He seemed to find my resolve amusing as his lips tilted upward slightly. This is a debriefing, the sand aim said, shoulders straightening and features turning serious. All present have to some extent or another been made aware of Aoka's unusual ability. Before we begin, I just want everyone to be sure that what is discussed and done in this office today is to only remain in this office. Anyone gossiping will be dealt with harshly. Am I understood? There were muttered assents throughout the room. I wasn't sure if it was necessary, but an assent left my lips regardless. Good. The Siratobi nodded. As I'm sure you know, an incident occurred yesterday afternoon, whereby Aoka ability awoke for the first time and lashed out at her sister. Not much is known, currently, about the specifics of the ability, but it's likely that it comes from her mother, Kagura's clan. Tsukumo frowned. You mean from the Kurama clan? The wielders of the Jinjutsu-based Kekai Genkai. Tsunade stepped forward. We can't know that for sure, Sensei. The symptoms don't match up with those who inherit the Kurama Kekai Genkai. I've never heard of a Jinjutsu that is capable of chronic associative amnesia. Actually, it might be. Mama supplied. The Kurama clan's Kekai Genkai can culminate in a variety of abilities all relating to the manipulating the human mind. There was a history list of the abilities obtained through the years, but Mama bit her lip. I'm no longer privy to such information anymore. Well, that would definitely be helpful in dealing with Aoka's control, Tsunade said. She turned to face the Hokage again. Will you be able to get it, Sensei? I'll see what I can do. Hiruzen replied. The Kurama clan are becoming a little bit more cloistered these days, but I'm sure if I pressure them enough he sighed. I'm dangerous, I said sullenly, almost to myself. Hiruzen looked at me sharply. What makes you say that? I looked down at the floor, embarrassed. I hurt my sister. I'm not in control of the hands, they go wherever they want and hurt whoever they want. I can't stop them, and neither can anyone else. That's why you want to seal them away, right? The hands? Jureya frowned. Is that what you call you ability? It's what they feel like. In my head. Long, skeletal fingers with yellow dragged nails creeping and scratching and stabbing their way through my head. Appa's grip on my shoulders tightened imperceptibly, giving me support. That's not it. I spun around to face Kakashi, whose presence I had forgotten until just now. They won't seal them away just because they're dangerous, he clarified, clearing his throat. A Kekai Genkai, any Kekai Genkai, would be a precious commodity to the village. I would imagine that every effort to help learn control over your abilities would have to be exhausted before Kenjutsu is used as a last resort to contain the situation. So then this isn't about me, I realized, my eyebrows lifting in incredulity. I turned to the Hokage. There's something more to this than you're telling, isn't that right, Hokage-sama? Here is in Saratobi chuckled lightly, making eye contact with Sakumo and my parents. You've raised a bright pair of kids here, they'll make fine shinobi. I glanced behind me, noting Mama's warm smile and Papa's proud body language, both my parents showing their pride in me through different means. They'll make fine shinobi that phrase just felt so wrong. To my family and I, being praised as being a fine shinobi was a great honor, especially if recognized by the Hokage himself. But it just felt so wrong. A grown man complimenting on what a good child soldier I'd make. I suppose I could chalk it up to my old world morals, how children fighting wars is an abhorrent idea, but this wasn't that world. You'd think I'd know that by now. But every now and then, some random sentence or gesture would spark a feeling and impression that came from before I was born. And I couldn't help but be disturbed that I would make my parents proud by being a fine child soldier. Yes, you are both right, but not completely. The Hokage explained. Yes, I think that sealing away Aoka's abilities would be for the best, it would keep herself and others safe, but you're correct in your deduction that that is not the only reason that Aoka's abilities will be sealed away tonight. Again, I'll remind everyone here that this information will not pass outside these walls. We murmured our agreement once again. The other nations have always watched Kanahagakur closely, being the first and largest hidden village on the continent provides us with this attention. There was nothing new to what he was telling me. 
Takahata-sensei had already provided us with a brief overview of where our village stood amongst the others. The Hokage continued on, nonetheless. We have an abundance of talented shinobi clans and Kekai Genkai users, and, from time to time, another village targets young children of notable talents to ascertain the basis of their abilities. You mean Kumagakur. Papa spat out the last word like it was poison. Yes, like Kumagakur, here is an agreed. But not just them. There have also been a series of missing child reports being made to the village, some of which are children of civilian families from distant fire country villages, which would provide no obvious benefit to their village. So why steal children, then? Kakashi's question echoed my own thoughts. Why would an enemy village steal children that could serve no purpose? A civilian child would know none of the village secrets, nor could they be used as a hostage to extort a significant clan. Well, you see, Jiraiya began. We're not entirely sure that they are being taken by the other villages, Appa heaved a deep breath. I'd heard rumors, but I had hoped that was all they were. All of this sounded really familiar, but for the life of me, I could not remember. It was on the proverbial tip of my tongue. W what does this have to do with me? I asked. You think that I might be taken? The sand aim looked at me, his aged face one of kind sympathy. He didn't even have to put his answer into words I already knew. Here is in turn to mama. I think it would be best if she were moved to the care of you family, Kagura-san. She would be safest there. Silence fell over the room before all hell broke loose. No. No way. Mama said sharply, stepping forward aggressively. I'd never seen her react in such a way before like a dangerous Kanoichi. I wasn't sure if I should be awestruck or frightened. My daughter is not going to those people. You don't think we can protect our own child? Papa face was hard and his hands tightened on my shoulders again. Your own child is right in front of you I hated when my parents talked about me like I wasn't even there. Calm down, Kurei Sakumo said, placing a placating hand on Papa's shoulder. No. No. Papa snarled, shaking off Sakumo's hand. This isn't Aoka's fault. She shouldn't have to be taken away from us because of some arbitrary circumstance. I couldn't believe he was behaving so so well, aggressive towards the Hokage. I felt relieved tears prick at my eyes as he confirmed my hopes that he and Mama still wanted me around that they still loved me. Sure, I knew that they loved me, but with all the trouble I had caused with Kurinai I had thought no, I had concluded that I was more trouble to them than I was worth. And them acting like I was something that they didn't want to lose. I loved them both so much. You're not thinking about this logically, Kurei-san, Kagura-san. Tsunade said calmly. Kagura-san's clan can provide her with a level of security that you can't Jiraiya interrupted her with a subtle elbow to the side. What? It's fact. This is because we're not recognized as a clan, isn't it? Papa accused, hands clenching into fists. The Ikis are just as much a clan as the Achiha or the Dehadics. Tsukumo shifted uncomfortably beside us. I would be uncomfortable too, if I were him. Kakashi was watching my father's rage with wide eyes, like I had been just a second ago. I was still amazed and frightened that he was speaking to his superiors in such a manner. Mama seemed to have better control over herself, but was letting Papa take point on the argument. But the Iki family is not a clan, Hiruzen said sharply, holding up a hand to hold off another tirade from Papa. And I cannot guarantee her safety should she stay in your care. Obviously, Hiruzen glared at Papa as he started to fume. Obviously I can't force you to relinquish custody over her. But with the Kurama clan she would fall under their political patronage. The choice is yours. And you don't have to decide right now, Jurea added, likely hoping to placate my ruffled father. She's not going to be taken from her family. Ayaka stays with us, Papa said determinedly. Maybe just think about it for, we're keeping our daughter, Mama reiterated. And we're not changing our minds. It was nice that they didn't want me to go. But what did I think? I wasn't sure. I wanted to stay with Mama and Papa and Kurinai, but something told me that our family dynamic would never quite be the same again, and a part of me didn't want to stick around to see how badly I'd screwed our family up. Well, isn't this just precious, drawled a velvet Y voice behind us a voice that I recognized and sent a shock of cold slicing down my spine. I turned slowly, hesitatingly. That voice, those kidnappings and abductions, they triggered the realization that I'd been struggling to make earlier. And as I turned I begged that it wasn't him, that I hadn't come to his notice and drawn his attention. But as luck would have it, I was wrong. The final member of the Sanon had arrived. Well, isn't this just precious, drawled a velvet Y voice behind us. A voice that I recognized and sent a shock of cold shooting down my spine. I turned slowly, hesitatingly. That voice, those kidnappings and abductions, they triggered the realization that I'd been struggling to make earlier. And as I turned I begged that it wasn't him, that I hadn't come to his notice and drawn his attention. But as luck would have it, I was wrong. The third Sanon had arrived. Arachimaru, the Hokage greeted evenly. Sensei. Arachimaru's thin lips twisted into a smirk. And Tsunade and Jureya too. 
My, my, and both the haddocks, isn't this just the exclusive party? What are you what is he doing here? Papa gritted out from between his clenched teeth. I shuddered as Orochimaru's gaze landed on me. I could feel him weighing me up, assessing my strength and potential in a split second. I wondered what he made of me. Not that it mattered, really. Orochimaru was a collector of jutsu, with a special interest in Kekai Genkai. And here I was, a Kekai Genkai user who had fallen right into his scaly lap. This was bad. Really bad. My, my, he remarked in a smooth, smug tone. What a pretty thing. I couldn't suppress a shudder at the sound of his slick voice. I had always been a little muddled when it came to the chronology of Orochimaru's horrible deeds and defection from Konoha, from my memory, none of them had been explicitly stated in the Anaimer manga. He still wore the leaf insignia on his hit I-8, which at least answered one of my questions. He hadn't defected yet. Perhaps he would know something about reincarnation, a small voice asked in the back of my head. If anyone would know anything about any jutsu pertaining to immortality and being reborn with your previous incarnation's memories, then it would be him. But was he an ally? No. Could I trust him? Hell no. Arachimaru was a wild card, his obsessive drive and thirst for knowledge could answer some of my questions, but could just as likely land my limbs in various test tubes for him to study. As if I needed to draw any more of his attention to myself. Definitely not worth it. Arachimaru sama, mama remarked in surprise, taking a step back. What are you doing here? I had a feeling that everyone already knew though. I did. A third shifted in his seat uncomfortably. We needed a proficient seal master, and Orochimaru has kindly offered him. Papa exclaimed. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed, and Papa quickly backtracked. I meant no offense, Orochimaru. I had just assumed that it would be Kashina-san. Kinjutsu was her family's specialty, after all. I noted the lack of deference and respect he gave to Orochimaru, it was like he wanted to snub the Sanin. I couldn't fathom why. Perhaps they had a history. Nonetheless, I could only hope that Orochimaru wouldn't hold it against us. Against me. But who was I kidding? It's true that Kashina Sen would have been first choice. But she's out on a mission in Lightning Country currently and isn't expected back for a few weeks. The Hokage explained tiredly. Since this was a time-sensitive issue, I called the next best. Thank you, Sensei, Orochimaru grinned lasciviously at the praise, licking his lips as if having eaten something tasty. The seal may require renewing, and I'm interested in how it will affect the girl's body and abilities. I have the most free time out of Tsunade, Jiraiya and myself, to look after the girl's seal. Then why are? Mama began. Why are Jiraiya and I here? Tsunade cut in, folding her arms. I've never seen this sealing jutsu done before. A student's job is never finished, I suppose. She added. Speak for yourself, Jiraiya muttered, earning him a fist to the ribs. He sank to his knees slowly, clutching at his stomach. Why? He wheezed. Why? Everyone ignored him. It was then that I noticed the two concentric circles drawn onto a cleared portion of the Hokage's floor, numerous kunai were embedded point downwards along the circumference of each circle at regular intervals, and a number of characters written in blood radiated out from the dead center. This was some powerful fkinjutsu even I could ascertain that much. It was unknown to me who had drawn the ritualistic seals on the floor and who or what's blood was being used to fuel the seal. No one told me and I didn't ask. Arachimaru moved forward, circling around me until he stopped before us, studying the seal that Tsunade had placed on my forehead earlier that day. A long pale finger stretched out and brushed against my forehead, and the feel of his chakra on me made me flinch. Arachimaru intoned quietly, his eyes staring at the seal rather than me, which was a relief. He turned to Tsunade. Tsunade, you'll have to undo the seal on her. She won't survive the sealing otherwise. That startled me. W what? Mama started. I thought this was supposed to be a safe and harmless procedure. The seal I placed on your daughter isn't entirely stable. Tsunade began, tentative. Ayaka's own chakra is involuntarily being redirected to stabilize the seal. Placing another seal on top of the one I put on her could drain her reserves completely and put a strain on her body, likely to cause cardiac arrest. I hadn't noticed before, but she was right. Most of my chakra was gone, it was odd. It didn't feel as though my chakra reserves were empty, but like my reserves had shrunk to a quarter of its previous volume. The only logical explanation prompted by Tsunade's own was that the seal had cordoned off most of my chakra to feed itself. I wondered if the seal would just fail or start eating at the chakra I had access to, if it used up the reserve of chakra it was feeding off. Tsunade looked at me suddenly, as though she were afraid I was going to have a breakdown right there and then. But it needn't come to that if we undo my seal first. She called it well. To say that I was feeling overwhelmed would be an understatement. At this point, I was ready to take my chances with the hands. I almost said as much. Almost. I mentally prepared myself and mustered my bravo. Okay I interrupted hesitantly. The adults and Kakashi turned to look at me, I could feel the weight of their gazes on me, and I swallowed audibly. Please. 
just do it. She's right, let's not waste more time, the Hokage concurred, and I flushed slightly, not sure whether to feel ashamed by my impatience or pleased that he shared it. Tsunade, if you please. Of course, Sensei. Come here please, Ayaka-chan, Tsunade said, ushering me into the center of the two circles of Ink and Kunai. A sudden realization struck me. If if you take away the seal then the hands will come back, won't they? I could practically feel my heart having palpitations. The hands? Tsunade asked slowly, clarifying that she had heard correctly. My stomach was shifting uncomfortably in my belly, and I felt a pang of dread. You mean your ability, correct? But they feel like hands, I repeated. Ayaka-chan, the Hokage said gruffly. I looked to him. Don't be scared, girl. Everyone here, bar one, is above the rank of Jimin. We can handle ourselves and we can handle you. I nodded. He was right, of course. I shouldn't doubt these people's abilities to protect themselves and each other, it was an insult to their abilities. You may want to kneel down, Tsunade said, and I went down to my knees. Two of her fingers were alight with small blue flames of chakra her index and middle finger. Tsunade held her lit fingers above my head, then jabbed her fingertips sharply into the center of my forehead. Two-pronged seal. Release. A peculiar tingling sensation ran down my spine, and I felt the same really. Perhaps it hadn't worked. I checked my chakra reserves and found that they remained the same. Small, pitiful, and chakra flooded my system in a sudden pent-up surge, and I stared, slack-jawed, off into the distance as the chakra roiled around within me. More and more seemed to be coming from behind the seal, and I couldn't stem the flow, couldn't halt the torrent from washing me away. Arrows, like great snakes, from my chakra reserves, flexing and stretching. A small sound of distress escaped my lips before I could stop it. The hands. Swollen and strong from where they had been marinating in my chakra since Tsunade's seal had been placed on me, they were unlike any of the others I had encountered. They were cleverer than before. They didn't hesitate, but nor did they scramble over each other to escape my skin. They moved in unanimous synchronicity as one entity. They moved together, with the strength of a battering ram, circling at first gaining momentum along my chakra pathways. This feeling wonderful, squeezing my eyes shut and slamming my hands over my ears, I braced myself for their impact and the pain I would feel, by trying to keep them off. But I would do this for Kurinai. For myself. I would do better than last time. I had to. But the hands had grown clever too. And I needn't have bothered bracing myself for their broken nails to scratch for release through my eyes and ears. They circled around within me, becoming denser and stronger and sure. They had a purpose, and they were all working towards it. Unusually aware of my chakra pathways and the hand's movements, I noticed what was about to happen only a split second before it actually did. The hands burst from the tinketsu based in my forehead in a fury, suddenly turning wild. They were insubstantial, however, and invisible. I couldn't even see them, but I could feel them no, more than that, I was a part of them. The hands pulled me along behind them as they stretched for the Hokage's mind, and I struggled pull myself back to fight the urge to have just a sneak peek within such a powerful man's head. To make him bow and scrape the floor below me. To control him and mastermind Kanahagakur's future evil sealing method. A smooth cold hand pressed down upon the nape of my neck. I felt the effects of the jutsu immediately. Sharp tingling sensations radiated out from the nape of my neck, and I knew what they brought. Lines and lines of characters of sealing script spread out over my body, down my arms, over my face, down my legs. The black script ran amok. I could feel it. I snapped back into my own head, feeling slightly disorientated. I could only imagine what I looked, and it wasn't pretty. Red eyes, swept wild black hair, black tattoo-like markings covering skin and hands formed of chakra stretching from my back. I must look demonic monstrous. Shut up. I snapped. No one cares what you look like. Arachimaru's hand for it could only be him that could make my skin crawl so left my neck. I half expected the seal to falter without his touch, but it remained steady, the sealing script winding itself around my body start to affect the hand's movements, slowing them, calming them. And for the first time since the sealing had begun, I felt like I had some semblance of control over what was happening, and I felt a calm assuredness fall over me at the thought. I felt collected and capable, as if a cloud had been lifted, and I could see with perfect clarity. It was amazing the amount of fear and indecision and regret I had been carrying around, and I felt all that much lighter without it like I could just float away. Hesitantly, dreading the whiplash my actions might cause, I began to tug my awareness of the hands back into myself. At first, there was no discernible difference, but as I pulled harder, willing the hands to obey with all myself they began to retract, dissipating into my skin like a fine mist into air. The hands moved backward slowly, not cowed but obedient rather. The seal continued its work, drawing its strength from my determination and pulling the hands to a point at the nape of my neck, the spot where Rachimaru had touched to initiate the jutsu. The hands now all contained stirred uneasily at the back of my head, but I willed them to stay down, and they stilled submissively within the confines of the seal. 
and I was left unsteady in the wake of the sudden absence. The hands had obeyed. I trembled in wonder, struggling to wrap my head around the very notion. Although it had been with obvious reluctance they had still obeyed. My eyes began to burn slightly. Maybe there was hope for me after all. The notion struck me. Maybe I had been able to control them all along, and it had been only me interfering with my control over my ability. I had issues, I knew that for sure. Inside my head, there was a constant struggle to retain who I had been Chelsea, the PhD student from Earth against the person I was becoming. Even now, I didn't know how to be my true self whoever or whatever that true self was. But maybe I didn't have to choose one or the other, perhaps I just needed to accept that Chelsea didn't have to die so that Ayaka could live. Perhaps I had been trying to tell myself that when I'd had that weird dream about Chelsea's life, well I had been unconscious after messing with Kurinai's head. What was in a name, anyway? I was who I was. And if I was two girls, each from two different worlds, then so be it. Surely I could handle that, so long as it didn't lead to a multiple personality disorder. I had read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and I didn't particularly want to wander into that horror novel. My life was on the rocks as it was. Ayaka. Mama said, breaking me out of my reverie. She was kneeling before me and had obviously been trying to get my attention for some time. I blinked owlishly and looked around. Papa was standing behind Mama, scanning me for any obvious injuries. Mama had always said that it was an automatic reflex on his part, looking out for his teammates and loved ones before they could succumb to an injury. Shinobi were notorious for not admitting to injury, Mama had tried to explain it to me that they believed it to be sign of weakness, but I couldn't think of it being anything other than stupid and childish. Tsukumo and Kakashi stood against the far wall of the room, exchanging hushed words. I wasn't sure what they were saying, but I wondered if it was a hushed argument. I hoped it wasn't about me. Seeing that Jiraiya and the Hokage were locked in conversation too, I turned further and found Orochimaru leaning against the wall, scrutinizing me with a small smile that seemed more and more predatory the longer I looked at it. Under his cold and dissecting gaze, I shuddered and his smile widened. Hearing a sound, I turned. Tsunade had stepped forward, pressing a hand of green healing chakra to my head to relieve a throbbing that I hadn't noticed was there until it was gone. The H thank you, Tsunade Sama. I gave her a small tired smile before yawning widely. Even though it seemed like years had passed since I had woken up in the hospital since I had erased my sister from my life, it had really only been a few hours. It was the middle of the night, I had just undergone what some might classify as a traumatic experience, and I needed my beauty sleep if I was going to face the world again tomorrow. You should be fine come morning, make sure you stay hydrated so the headache lessens, Sunade said. How does your chakra feel? I checked my reserves. Fine, I admitted happily. Like normal. Does this mean I can go back to the academy tomorrow? Sunade and my parents chuckled lightly. I don't see why not, Sunade replied. So long as your parents are okay with it. I looked up at Mama and Papa with the biggest puppy dog eyes I could muster. Please. Sure, Mama replied, quickly engulfing me in a hug. I could see Papa over her shoulder, shaking his head in wry amusement. The Hokage called our attention back to him a moment later and inquired about the incident that had happened with Kurinai. Papa stepped forward to answer, but Siratobi Sama waved him down and gestured to me with a kindly smile. With trepidation, I wriggled free of Mama's embrace and turned to face the Hokage. He wanted to know about what I had done to Kurinai. There was just so much that had happened that I didn't know what in particular he wanted to hear. Ayano Hokage-sama I don't know where to start I confessed, embarrassed. Start at the beginning, Ayaka-chan. I would like to know everything that occurred from your perspective. Everyone was watching me now. I had told Mama and Papa, but this was going to be new knowledge to everyone else in the room. Sakumo and Kakashi moved closer, and Sakumo gave me encouraging smile, but I still had reservations about sharing everything. How could I not? Arachimaru was standing right there, listening to me explain how I was an ideal candidate for experimentation. I bet he couldn't wait to open up my insides to see what made me tick. I couldn't help the shudder that rolled through me. But the hokage was here, and I couldn't very well lie and say I had nothing to do with it, it was way too late for that. So I did as the hokage asked I started at the beginning, hoping that he'd be interested enough in me to keep me safe from Arachimaru. I started with a spar between Kurinai and myself, then tried to skim over the part where the hands appeared and messed up Kurinai's head to when I woke up in hospital and found that Kurinai didn't recognize me. But the hokage wouldn't have it. The hands just appeared. Out of nowhere. He asked, wanting specifics. Oh dear, how to explain this and no, not exactly. I started, then frowned, thinking. How could I explain this? Kurinai was beating me, I mean, it's not like I wanted to hurt her. I didn't, I swear. It really was an accident. But but. I was working myself up into a frenzy and I knew it. But you just wanted to win, the Hokage guessed with a slightly amused expression. I understand. You're not in trouble. I wasn't. 
they don't think I'm some crazed child with dangerous powers. Well that was a relief. The Hokage asked me a few more questions about the hands, seeming to focus on the aspect that I had entered Kurinai's mind with little to no difficulty. He seemed to be bemused by the thought, asking if I had somehow meant to wipe myself from Kurinai's mind. I hand. The questions continued until I gave a yawn so wide that the Hokage seemed to think better than to keep pressing me at this hour of the night. All right, thank you Ayaka-chan. He said, standing up and making his way around his desk towards me. He ruffled my hair affectionately. I appreciate your honesty tonight. I'll be watching your progress in the future closely, so be sure to make your parents proud. Why yes sir. I replied giddily, blushing slightly at his praise. I was relieved too, hopefully that would serve as a message to Arachimaru that I was out of bounds for his personal experimentations. We left the Hokage's office soon after that, the Sanin staying behind to no doubt discuss what had transpired tonight. I wished I could say that I cared enough to wonder what they were saying, but I was so tired that all I wanted to do was sleep. We split up from the haddocks as we made our respective ways home. I realized when we were almost at home that my parents hadn't checked me out of the hospital. Perhaps I should have said something, but didn't want to risk them changing directions and taking me back to spend the night at the hospital. The night I would sleep in my own bed. I could deal with everything else tomorrow. Where the hell have you been? Anko grumbled the next morning as she stomped up to my desk. Takahata-sensei had yet to arrive, which wasn't unusual for our reluctant sensei. I wondered if he'd have a hangover today too, it wouldn't be the first time he had turned up to class late after a big night out. I, when I was Chelsea, had never been much of a drinker too much of a lightweight. Shame. I've been sick, I replied, fidgeting my hands nervously beneath the desk. Would she pick up on my lie? Mama and Papa had said to just act like things were normal, but they weren't and never would be. I shook my head as if to clear my thoughts. I was being too depressed too angst-ridden. If there were anything I should have learned to take home from the ceiling last night, it should be to let bygones be bygones and move on. Anko was already eyeing my suspiciously I wasn't acting like my usual self, and she could tell. Ah, Anko-chan, I began playfully, knowing she hated being referred to as Chan. I gave her a sly smile. Did you miss me? That seemed to throw her, and she visibly scrambled to reply. D don't be ridiculous. You were only gone for, like, two days. But it meant I had to hang out with those losers instead. She jerked her thumb over her shoulder as if pointing at someone. I peered around her, squinting. Who? Aha. Found it. A hand appeared from behind a desk, holding up a small wrapped on a jerry, as if it were a prized treasure. Oh no. I've been looking for ages. Izumo. I found it. Kitetsu Hagen climbed up from behind the desk as another boy waddled into class. Izumo Kamizuki was a lot fatter as a kid than he had been in the anime as an adult, and I remembered that I'd always thought him to be relatively intelligent. Instead, he just liked to eat. Clutching a bag of flavored chips to his chest, he waddled over to Kitetsu, not noticing Anko and I. Is that the onajiri you hid last week? Yup. Free lunch for me today. W-O-O Kitetsu cheered. You're going to share right? Of course. The two boys whooped and high-fived each other. I think I'm going to vomit, I whispered to Anko. Two days, she whispered back. Two days of this. I stood and patted Anko on the back consolingly. Two days. Really? It took two days of searching to find out the onajiri was under his seat. I wrinkled my nose. Boys are gross. Then thought of Sakumo-sama and quickly amended, well, most boys anyway. You're crazy. All boys are gross. Oh. Iki-chan is back. Izumo said loudly. I winced and turned my back to them stiffly, pretending that I hadn't heard him. Anko followed suit. Ayaka-chan. Hey. Kitetsu called. Good morning, Iki-chan. Hey. Ayaka-chan. Iki-chan. Ayaka-chan. Hello. Iki-chan. Turn around. Go away, go away, go away. Ayaka cha there was a loud crashing sound as one of the boys knocked over what sounded like several desks and chairs. I risked a glance over my shoulder to see both boys making their way towards us. Izuma waddling precariously and Kitetsu picking himself up out from beneath a heap of desks, handling the onajiri between his two bare hands. The two boys were as thick as thieves now just as much as they would be in the future, and Anko and I often interacted with them. You might even say we were friends, if begrudgingly. But I knew who they would become later on, and so where none of the others would give them the time of day, I listened. I smiled and laughed at their lame jokes. They were both oddballs, but I couldn't lie that I liked both of them. Well, to a certain line. When it came to their eating and hoarding tendencies, that's where I drew the line. But it wasn't unusual for our civilian-born classmates to gravitate towards Anko and me once they found out that neither of us were from clans. Which was weird, really. It wasn't like it was unusual to have shinobi parents and not be from a clan. 
and even though I wasn't from a shinobi clan, I was still raised in the same manner as my clan-born classmates training from an early age, lessons in chakra control, instruction on family jutsu techniques the list goes on. What should we do? I whispered and then glanced behind us again. Do you think we could make a break for the door? Benko shook her head. We wouldn't make it. The windows. I gave her a searching, incredulous look. You want to jump out the window. It could be worse. Worse than a three-story fall. Benko scrunched her face up and thought. Maybe not. She acquiesced. We could try fighting them off. Hiding them? Yeah, I've got some paperbums in my bag, Anko gave me a meaningful look and a slightly crazed grin. Why on earth would she have alright, this was Anko. You want to explode two of our fellow classmates? I asked, stunned. In which world could that ever be a good idea? Thoughtful, Anko nodded. You're right. Too messy. Ayaka-chan. Good morning. They were right behind me and I shuddered. If they offered me a piece of that onajiri, I was going to barf. Violently. Good morning, Kamizuki-san. Hagging kun. I greeted with forced cheer, trying not to eyeball the dusty onajiri in Kitetsu's hand. How are you both? Ayaka, Kitetsu asserted with a cocky smile. Call me Kitetsu. We're familiar enough with each other. No, we weren't. I don't think. Call me Izumo, too. Izumo said excitedly, then faltered. That's that's okay, isn't it? He looked at me with wide, doe-like eyes, and I felt my resolve crumble a little bit. Distractedly, I muttered an eloquent uh, I guess, before Anko stepped in between us. Alright, thanks for the chat. Oh wow. Look over there. Ahinito san dropped his, uh, bento box, Anko said to the two boys, whose expression perked up at the sound of the bento box. Where? They both exclaimed, eerily in sync. Anko pointed. Over there. It might be hidden somewhere so you'll have to look pretty hard too. They were both already gone. A bento box. I asked. That bento box story will keep them busy for weeks. Anko cackled, sitting down in her seat beside my own desk. I sat down also. It was me who told them the story about the onajiri to begin with, I ended up just buying the onajiri and hiding it under Hagane's seat. I frowned. Anko. That's pretty mean. The FFT. Who cares? Anko replied, blithely. And what the hell were you doing? Are you trying to encourage them? What do you mean? Oh please, they both practically drool all over you when you walk into a room. Anko said, giving me a dry look. Oh, Ayaka-chan, you're so pretty. Oh, Iki-chan, you're so nice to me. Ooh, Ayaka-chan, thank you for letting me wipe your ass. It's disgusting. Hey. Not nice. I said, punching her in the arm to hide the fact I was struggling to contain my smile. I'm just nice to them, that's all. No one else gives them the time of day. Of course no one gives them the time of day. They're both losers. Anko picked up her backpack and dumped its contents onto her desk, sending paraphernalia skittering in all directions. They probably won't even make it through the year, let alone graduate. Something about her flippant disregard her condescension pissed me off. They aren't losers. And I believe that they will become good shinobi. I said angrily, starting feel my eyes water. Though having knowledge of future events was the only thing that made me believe in them becoming shinobi. Generally, they were both at the bottom tier of the class if not dead last. Kitetsu was notoriously lazy, almost comparable to Inara, but without the keen intellect. And Izumo, while not lazy, tended to give his all at everything and wore his heart on his sleeve too much, often becoming discouraged at not being able to keep up with his classmates. That and the fact that he was a little okay, maybe more than a little, fat. Not that I judged. The Akamichi clan were known for being chubby, but they held claim to Jutsu that made it necessary, even preferable, to be overweight rather than thin. Enko gave me a strange look. Okay, okay. We'll just have to agree to disagree are you crying? No. I wiped at my eyes with the palm of my hands. I'm angry. When I'm angry my eyes tear up. Aha. Uh -huh. It's true. Okay, okay. Sheesh. Don't get your knickers in a twist. My knickers are not in a twist. The classroom door opened and Takahata sensei entered, holding a bottle of water in one hand and a folder in his other. We all made to stand up at his arrival. Alright you little shit faces. Shit faces. That was a new one. Sit the fuck down. I don't want to hear shit from you brats, I've got a thumping headache and I'm not in the mood to deal with your shit. Slowly, we sat down. Students hurrying to their seats while Takahata sensei squinted around at the class, as if the room were too bright and our presence in the classroom an annoyance. Yep, he was definitely hungover. Icky. Takahata sensei said, squinting at me closely. I jumped to my feet abruptly. H hi. Finally decided to rejoin us in class today. Good. Sit down. Midarashi, stop grinning like a damn fool, or I'll bring forward next week's testa tomorrow and use you as kunai practice. A sudden hush fell over the class at the threat. Okay, we'll begin with where we left yesterday oh for fuck's sake, Kamizuki, do you ever stop eating? S-sensei. 
see can we please stop running now? Complained a thin boy with glasses somewhere to my left as we ran around the perimeter of training grounds 12. If you have the energy to complain, you have the energy to run. Narissa Sensei snapped, jogging alongside us effortlessly. She held a long whip in one hand, which she would crack menacingly on the heels of any stragglers falling too far behind the pack of running students. Many things had changed between our first year at the academy and our second year. For one thing, almost a quarter of our cohort had dropped out of the academy. I didn't know if they had been kicked out or if they just quit because they hadn't found the shinobi life as appealing as they thought it to be. Not that it particularly mattered. I was still here and that was all that mattered to me. At least Izumo and Kitetsu had made it through the year, which amazed me. Aster. There was a crack from Narissa Sensei's whip somewhere behind me. Those of us with enough energy let out groans colored with our varying stages of desperation at the directive, but we picked up the pace regardless. It seemed like Narissa Sensei fed off of the suffering of others and my training routine, I'd been trialing running these kinds of marathons without enhancing my muscles with chakra, hoping that if the need arose, I would be able to move faster and last longer than my peers, but all it did was tire myself out faster. I learned the hard way during running class that it was harder to focus chakra with a fatigued body and mind than if I had been using chakra all along. But still. I'd have to keep at it. I'd been trialing for several weeks now and there was already a notable improvement in my speed and stamina. Pastor. Akahata sensei is nothing compared to Narissa sensei, I thought, contemplating the dark-haired woman running alongside us with the whip in her hand. A whip. Did Shinobi even use whips? I hate this, Anko grumbled to my right. I hate her. SHH. She'll hear you. Like I care. Do you think I'll be instantly promoted to Genin if I kill her? She is a Chknin, you'd have to be a pretty impressive academy student to kill a Chknin, right? Actually maybe I'll skip straight to Chknin. I guess, I agreed, noncommittally. I would have shrugged my shoulders, but was trying to provide as little physical indication to Narissa Sensei that we were talking during her declared running time, she'd probably make us run at the front of the group as punishment. You don't think I could take her? Anko asked. Sweet lord, Anko had an inflated ego. No way would she be able to take on a Genin, let alone a Chknin. I was saved from answering by the crack of Narissa Sensei's whip, followed by a loud yelp. Twisting around, I could see that it had been a boy with spiky black hair, only slightly older than me falling behind at the back of the group, zigzagging wildly to escape Narissa Sensei's whip as she tried to hit him with it. Somebody help. There's a madman after me. He cried. Crack. Sorry. Sorry. Madwoman. Crack. Uh. Happy woman. Crack. An independent woman who doesn't need a man to. Crack. What do you want from me? I felt a little bad for the guy to be honest, but no way was I going to intervene. We should intervene, Anko stage whispered, jogging closer to me so I could hear her. How come she was my opposite in so many ways? We honestly should have killed each other a long time ago through some disagreement or other. Are you crazy? Do you want to be eaten alive by the whip bitch? I asked, incredulous, referring to our favorite teacher by our pet name for her. Mon. It'll be fun. No. It won't. She pouted. You never follow any of my ideas. Sure, I do. Remember the prank we played on Gai Kun? I reminded. That doesn't count. I meant a good idea that you weren't initially opposed to. We went to that new dango stand last week, that was your idea. Actually, that was a good idea. We should go there again soon. Anko said, not bothering to hide the fact that she was salivating heavily at the thought of eating more dango. Now that's a good idea, Anko. Anko shook her head briefly. Stop trying to distract me. We're saving that poor innocent Achiha man child if it's the last thing we do. I snorted derisively. It'll be the last thing you do wait, Achiha. He's in Achiha. I looked at the dark-haired boy again, watching the comical spouts of tears from his eyes as he barely avoided another whiplashing. He definitely didn't exude the same sense of quiet confidence that the other Achiha did, although I supposed he shared the same basic features. Dark eyes, black hair, pale skin. But that was where the similarities ended, where the other Ichihas I'd met were reserved and rather conceited, he was practically bursting with energy. Yeah, that guy's a Beto Ichiha. He's notorious for being the first Ichiha to reach the position of dead last in academy history. Anko glanced at me sideways. I'm surprised you haven't heard of him. Oh, Beto Ichiha. I remembered him. He was the Naruto of the previous generation. Of my current generation, I supposed. He was the epitome of positivity and energy within Team Minato. Upbeat and ready to force his glass half full opinions on Kakashi and anyone else that doubted him, he had had no friends in the academy, if my memory served me correctly. No one to rely on, maybe I. Oh god, was I really contemplating going along with Anko's harebrained scheme? No way. Yes. No. I reiterated. Besides, if he's dead last he probably needs the tough love. Anko's grin turned predatory to say the least. 
Looks like I'm going to have to make some destruction by myself. She reached into her pocket where she usually kept her explosive tags. Bud. You do that. Leave me out of it. And are you ever going to tell me how you keep getting paper bombs? No chance in hell. But you'll tell me where you get your explosives. Or that you'll leave me out of it. Both. Garrison Saratobi stood in his office, having just received the latest report of the Aki girl's exploits. Several explosions had been heard in the vicinity of a second-year cohort of academy students and, fearing that it was an enemy attack, he had sent a small squad of Anbu to ascertain the situation. What the situation had turned out to be was a ragtag group of academy student renegades wanting to cause some trouble. A group of seven two girls and five boys. Among them was the Aki girl. The report had listed the names. Kitetsu Hagen, Izumo Kamazuki, Ayaka Iki, Anko Mitarashi, Genma Shiranui, Mike Guy, and Abito Che. That particular Ichiha boy always created a bit of a stir, but the Mitarashi girl was nothing but trouble. Not that he could do anything about it. Some of his strongest subordinates had started out with having a penchant for mischief. He sighed. He had kept his word from all those months ago, keeping an eye on the girl, tracking her progress in the academy, and observing to make certain that she didn't accidentally display the abilities she possessed in public. That was very important. Making sure that Ayaka's mother's clan, the Kurama clan, didn't find out and sink their claws into her. Or begin a custody battle. Girizin did not need that kind of stress heaped onto his already very full plate. The third Hokage loathed thinking of the possible repercussions of Ayaka falling into the Kurama clan's sway. The clan had always had an inflated sense of self-worth since before the founding of Konoha, but, with the dwindling number of Kekai Genkai users in their clan, they had sobered a little over the years. They did not have the time or the patience to deal with another Ichiha clan lording their Kekai Genkai over the other clans and villages. He sighed again and leant against his desk slightly, massaging his temple with a single hand. They would find out eventually, of that he was sure. He'd prefer it to be later as opposed to sooner, but he would have to be naive to believe that no one had noticed that Kurei's two daughters treated each other as strangers when they had once been so very close. Not only that, but the family had been summoned to his office in the middle of the night. Anyone with enough resources to keep tabs on the third Hokage's every move would no doubt have noticed. And possibly investigated. The one saving grace for the girl, the Sandane thought Riley, was that her mother had been excommunicated from the Kurama clan for marrying outside the clan. Kagura's name had been slashed from every record book that the clan held, and so only those who remembered Kagura Iki as Kagura Kurama would know that she ever existed at all. But still, it wasn't much in terms of defenses. And yet, resigned, he sat down at his desk and began shuffling papers around, absentmindedly sorting them into piles. There was nothing more he could do for the Iki girl, for Ayaka, at the moment anyway. All those months ago when the Ikis, Haddix and his Sanin had gathered during the night in his office, Kure and Kagura had both refused to allow the Kurama clan to gain political patronage of Ayaka. And in doing so, had placed themselves in a very awkward position and Ayaka in a potentially dangerous one. There was a reason why most Kekai Genkais occurred in clans. The Kurama clan, much as he was reluctant to admit, could keep Ayaka safer than her own parents could. Shaking his head, Hiruzen pushed away the issue. Nothing had happened, he shouldn't stress over a non-issue, he had more important things to worry about, such as the reports he had received from the northern border of the Land of Fire. So far, they were inconclusive and in the midst of undergoing various investigations, but it seemed like a large team of foreign shinobi had crossed the border without informing the border guards, as diplomatic emissaries should have done. Hopefully it turned out to be nothing, but still it was worrisome. The shuriken hit the tree trunk with a pleasing thunk. It was the first time today that my shuriken had managed to hit the wooden log without rebounding off the wood, but, whilst being a minor victory, it had still missed the bullseye by a good half foot. Focus, Iki. Takahata sensei called from the other side of the training ground. You're falling behind the class. It was true, by this stage most of my classmates shuriken were at least making contact with bullseye board on their respective tree logs, while I had spent the past 20 minutes missing the tree. I really needed to lift my game. It was embarrassing. At least Papa wasn't here to see this. Actually, he probably wouldn't even care. It seemed as though he had no inclination to oversee my training these days. Ever since the incident with Kurinai he no longer taught me Jinjutsu. Occasionally, he'd tell me to go practice my katas, but other than that he hadn't dared to bring Jinjutsu back into my training schedule, as if perhaps he thought it would trigger a relapse or something. At hand. The seal on the nape of my neck had the hands bound tightly, and any tentative or controlled use of my chakra didn't stir them in the slightest. Picking up another shuriken, I threw it at the bullseye. This. I had been practicing my jinjutsu on my own, in my room, at training grounds wherever I could, and I had suffered no relapse. The seal was holding strong, just as it was supposed to. Sure, it made my chakra a little less fluid and malleable, but
but the Jinjutsu I was learning were basic ones that didn't require complete accuracy and precision. It was hard, even now, getting familiarized with a chakra that I had had complete control over, but was now rigid and inharmonious, but I supposed it was a small price to pay for complete control over oneself. I threw another shuriken. Hunk. It hit slightly closer to the bullseye mark this time, but I wasn't paying too much attention being too caught up in my own reverie. It wasn't fair. I wanted to keep my lessons with papa books and scrolls could only teach you so much. And there was so many questions that only a person could answer when it came to Jinjutsu to casting not just a plausible Jinjutsu, but knowing exactly when to cast one too. Questions like, how to make someone under the Jinjutsu feel a certain temperature, or how to make his or her stomach clench in anxiety or fear. There were a lot of aspects to consider in making a realistic illusion. Aspects that also included psychological manipulation. Not that that was something I had been looking forward to, but I could admit that it would be an advantageous skill to have as a shinobi. Yes. I got it. I finally got it. Abito whooped a short distance away. He had finally managed to stick a shuriken to his practice log and was doing a happy little dance to himself. Nobody seemed to be paying him any attention though, I wasn't sure if it was because nobody had heard him or they just didn't care. Now that I thought about it, Abito was alone a lot. I didn't think that I had seen him with a single friend since Anko, and I had busted him out of our running class, along with the devious Genma, ridiculously energetic guy who thought we were doing extra laps and made to join us, and Katetsu, dragging along a reluctant Izumo. Perhaps I should make an effort to, seemingly out of nowhere, I heard a projectile whistle towards the side of my face. Flinching, the shuriken flashed through the empty space that had I not moved would have cut straight through my nose. I stared at the thrown projectile for a full second as it hit the ground with a muffled thud before my body kicked into gear. I darted backwards as another shuriken rushed me. It was clumsily thrown, not enough power behind it to cause serious damage as the previous shuriken would have, but the trajectory was true. I spun to face my attacker. A small group of my civilian-born classmates stood nearby, watching me. At the front was a petite brunette girl who I had a strained relationship with. And by strained, I mean a love-hate relationship. As in, she loved to hate me. I usually dismissed her snide remarks and snipes at my person. She was civilian born and didn't largely matter in the scheme of things. I made no effort to associate or endear myself to her, although I was certain her name was Ibarra. But if she was the one that had thrown that first kunai at me, then it was evident that she had some skill with projectiles. A boy about my own age stepped forward out of the group to stand beside her. I couldn't remember his name although his face seemed familiar enough. He was likely civilian born too. I dismissed him before I even realized it. Dodge this, demon girl. The boy shouted and swung his hands forward. Shuriken that I hadn't realized he had been holding whistled towards me, and I dived out of the way. Demon girl, it was a stupid and childish insult directed at the unnatural features of my icky eyes. Two redder eyes as per eye certainly weren't a feature hard to miss in a face. But the insults and jokes of me being demonic had rolled straight off my back in the past, and I saw no reason why that should change now. I liked my eyes, they were unique, and and was I really having a monologue about this in the middle of being pursued by another barrage of shuriken. I really needed to get a handle on myself. Sometimes I could just ramble about nothing for ages and totally space out without even, oh my god. I need to stop. I pushed off from the ground as the boy and Ibarra both launched another shuriken at where I had just been lying on the ground. Clusters of students were beginning to congregate around us, drawing the attention of Takahata-sensei. What are you doing? I yelled, startled but managing to narrowly dodge yet another shuriken. You still think you're so much better than us? Ibarra snarled back, her pretty face crunching in anger. Just because you have shinobi parents. Well I do have shinobi parents. I can't help that. My heart was thundering in my chest, and I was glad that my voice had come out firm and chiding, I was seriously trying not to stutter and show how nervous I was. Why did Anko have to be homesick with the flu today? Hey hey. What the fuck's going on here? Takahata-sensei strode between the three of us, glaring at us both. He eyed the shuriken strewn around me and turned to face Ibarra, who was now standing alone as her group, and the boy had beat a hasty retreat at the sight of sensei. Did you throw those at her? He asked Ibarra in a quiet tone that set me on edge. She and the other Ichiha think that they're so high and, Ichiha. She thinks I'm Ichiha. That's a laugh. If I were Ichiha, I'm pretty sure the clan would come down on you like a ton of bricks. I couldn't give a rat's ass what she thinks about you, Takahata said calmly. But did you just attack your own classmate? She provoked me. Ibarra shouted, frustrated. Takahata-sensei turned to look at me, eyebrows raised, asking me to explain myself. No, she didn't. Abito shouted, racing forward to stand beside me. I saw the whole thing. I frowned. No, you didn't. 
I was watching you, you were practicing I stopped, realizing that I had just ruined any chance of Takahata sensei, believing that I hadn't actually directly provoked Ibarra's attack. Yeah, I was paying attention. I was secretly watching you watching me secretly watching you. He grinned and then winced. Does that even make sense? You were secretly watching me? I couldn't decide whether to be flattered or offended. Yeah. I was watching you fail at shuriken throwing. Offended, then. Definitely offended. Like you're one to talk, I muttered. You can't listen to him. The bar exclaimed, jabbing at Abito with her pointy little index finger. He's from the same clan as her. He's obviously going to lie for her. I frankly urged to roll my eyes. As cool as it would be, I was not a cha. No, I'm not. Abito argued. It doesn't matter that we're related. Sensei, this girl attacked my cousin without a reason. She's lying. For goodness sake. I cried, throwing my hands in the air. I'm not in a chair. Abito turned to me in surprise. You're not. Abara frowned. You're not. No. But you've got the Sharingan and everything, Abito said, looking confused. I'm six years old. How could I have the Sharingan? This is my normal eye color. Really? Abito peered at my face, squinting his eyes in concentration. Whoa, you're right. That's really freaky. I slumped. Abito was doing wonders for my self-confidence. Okay, everyone. Iki-chan here is part of the Iki family, not the Achiha clan. Takahata-sensei exclaimed to the class of students that I suddenly noticed had surrounded us. It must have been the whole class by the looks of it. Everyone satisfied. Good. Now get the fuck back to throwing shuriken at logs and not other people. He stomped off and the group dispersed quickly, Ibarra among them, leaving just Abito and I alone together. Slightly annoyed but eager for him to leave, I blurted out the most eloquent thank you I could get past my lips. Uh, thanks for helping with, um, that. Abito grinned at me. No problem. He chirped, slinging an arm around my shoulders casually. So, uh, the Icky family, huh? Hey, I think I've heard of them actually. That's nice, I replied, shrugging off his hand and moving over to my log. I began pulling out the shuriken that had stuck to the wood, being careful not to cut myself. Walking several paces back, I took aim at the log again and then, you're holding it wrong, you know. Completely botched the throw. The shuriken flew off into the tree line, disappearing from sight. I spun to face Abito, angry and startled that he was still here. I just assumed that he'd gone back to his practice log. What are you still doing here? Watching you, of course. He grinned at me charmingly. I wasn't amused. I don't need to be watched. I said gruffly, turning my back to him and grabbing another shuriken from my small pile. You should go practice your own shuriken throwing. It's my duty to help others. Because one day, I'm gonna be don't say hokage, don't say hokage, don't say hokage hokage. I mentally fascipened. I did not need his glass half full perspective right now. Nor did I want it. Well, then go help someone else. Nah, I think I'll help you. I don't need your eye broke off in surprise as he suddenly grabbed my hand. You don't hold the shuriken between your forefinger and thumb, it makes your grip loose and your throw flimsy, he began, plucking the shuriken from my astonished fingertips and pressed it flat between my forefinger and middle finger. You see. You're supposed to hold it like that. That way, your grip is stronger and you can keep your wrist tight when you throw, giving you both power and greater accuracy. He was right. The shuriken felt more natural in my hand this way, and by positioning just so the sharp blades of the shuriken weren't cutting my skin like I had expected them to. You can let go of my hand now. He hastily removed his hand from mine, his face flushing. This isn't going to work, you know. I muttered. Yeah it will. Just give it a go. Sighing, I turned to face the log with the painted bullseye on it again. Drawing back my hand it really did feel much more comfortable in my hand like this, I snapped my arm forward into a throw. Thunk. It hit the log, only slightly above the center of the bullseye, making me gape in open astonishment. Abito began bouncing around, whooping like a crazed kid on a sugar rush. Maybe he was a crazed kid on a sugar rush. W-O-O you did it. He cheered. I stared at the shuriken. No way. It must have been a fluke. I picked up another shuriken and positioned it how Abito had told me, paused for a moment to take aim, and then let it fly. It hit dead center. W-A-A Iki-chan. You did it. And it's all because of me. Abito cheered again, running forward to glomp me with stars in his eyes. Ah. No. Get off me. We are becoming one, Iki-chan. He don't say things like that. Someone might get the wrong impression. This feels so good, Iki Chan. Uh, stop saying pee pervy things, you perv. Aw, oh, come on. It's just a hug. With enough squirming, I managed to wriggle out of his hold enough for me to plant my foot in his face and kick him away. He landed heavily on the ground a short distance away. Appa had always said that kicks were more powerful than a punch could ever be, and many effective Kinoichi relied on kicks to take down larger opponents, the downside to that was that kicks were also usually slower than a punch. 
You're so mean, Icky Chan, Abito sobbed, water pouring out of his eyes dramatically. Wow. He's really melodramatic, I thought. I would have expected a performance this good from Guy, but from Abito well, I suppose that he had been pretty over the top erm, passionate in the anime when he was younger, as well as when he was a part of Team Minato furthermore, since when had he even been in my class. He was supposed to be a year or two ahead of me, wasn't he? I looked at Abito closely, he was now sitting cross-legged on the ground pouting. Cute. I fought the urge to roll my eyes. He was definitely older than me, but not by much. I'd place him at being around 8 years old. If memory served, most students graduated from the academy at the age of 12. At least, the Kanoha 12 had in the manga. But that was during peace times. The third shinobi world war had still yet to take place, but from what I could remember from Chelsea, there should be mounting tensions between the villages, which meant that Kanahagakur would be graduating students at an earlier age in an effort to pump out more shinobi to fight in the war. I was extrapolating, sure, but it was the logical choice in war times. As Chelsea, I had done written an essay describing the reasoning of the conscription of soldiers for the Vietnam War. It could be seen that the Third Shinobi War and the Vietnam War have little in common, but many things remain the same, no matter the world you're born in. Wars can only be fought if you have soldiers. Whether or not this meant Abito would graduate alongside Rin and be assigned to Team Minato remained to be seen. I was well aware of the fact that I could have tampered with timeline from just interacting with people like Abito, Hanko and the Third Hokage. I could very well have changed the timeline by just being born into this world, but that wasn't a theory I was keen to believe in. I often considered how I might have affected the timeline. If I should affect the timeline if I should just run far away from this land and just leave things to occur as the manga dictates, but I had been born into Kanahagakur. It was my home now. I had friends and family here, and I wasn't going to hide or tiptoe around this world in fear of changing the timeline. Regardless, I had heard a saying once, that time was like a river, and a river wasn't going to change direction, just because someone has thrown a pebble into it. Sure, it'll cause ripple, but everything will sort itself out in the end. The river will keep flowing in the same direction. How philosophical of me. Well, I had been a PhD student, so I suppose it made sense to a certain degree. Icky. Takahata-sensei was suddenly bearing down on me, not looking impressed. Are you finished pondering the mysteries of the universe? Maybe once you're done, you can rejoin the rest of the class so we can move on to sparring practice. Everyone was staring at Abito and I intently, being the only ones not standing in the center of the clearing with the rest of the class. H. Hi. Goman, Sensei. But Sensei, we were having a moment. And you. Takahata Sensei rounded on Abito, jabbing his finger at him. I allowed you join in with my class so that you could learn everything you didn't bother to learn last year that your third year classmates have already mastered. So don't fucking waste my time. You can sit out and watch for the rest of this lesson. With that, he stalked back to my classmates, who began edging away from his angry glares nervously. No. Sensei. Sensei waited. Abito fell to the ground again, stretching out his hand in a pathetic attempt to catch the already distant Sensei. He looked ridiculous and pathetic. Crouching over him, I patted his hair consolingly. For a spiky-haired boy, his hair was surprisingly soft. Icky. Hi. Coming. I stood up, realizing I had been patting him for longer than I intended. But as I watched Abito sober and gaze up at me with that quirky little grin on his face, I had to wonder. Just how big of a pebble was I?